question. Well, uh, we, we'll, it's, it's run enough now that we've covered the blank spot anyway. You had, uh, Henning had just asked me, what was the question, who am I? Yeah, who are you? Well, who am I? <laughs> as well as I can describe it, I, like you and every other human being, is an incredibly unique arrangement of subatomic particles. They are so uniquely arranged that with this brain, which science agrees consists of subatomic particles, uniquely arranged in atoms, molecules, and etc., it's so uniquely arranged that we can think with it. And we can think more than a dog has a brain, and to the extent it thinks. We can do more than that with this electrical, mechanical thing in our brain. If you think a thought, there is a reaction in your brain. There's a chemical, electrical action in your brain, and connections are made, and etc. And you've thought the thought. And but without that ability to connect the things, or the brain to think with, you could not think a thought. I couldn't think a thought. So, right now I'm a very unique arrangement of subatomic particles. When I die, that arrangement no longer exists. My subatomic particles that were me exist, just like bricks in a house that decays away. The bricks are still there, but they're meaningless now because they are not properly arranged. Now let me explain how important the arrangement of things is. If, here's a, an example I use when I lecture sometimes at universities. If we had a great big parade ground here and we strewed it with gray billiard balls and we s said, uh, we took somebody out there and said, uh, what do you see? They'll say, I just see a whole bunch of gray balls strung out here at random. If you get up in an airplane look down, it just looks like a gray field. See, it's nothing but a bunch of gray billiard balls. But all you have to do is step out in there and take a very few of them and arrange them so it says E equals MC squared. Now all at once, it's still just a bunch of billiard balls, right? But now the unique arrangement of that segment says something very profound to people who understand it, which I don't. But it's Einstein's uh, famous thing. So uh, when I die, the unique arrangements no longer exist, and I cannot think. I will not have any awareness of self ever again. Before I was born, I was, at one time, I was an egg in my mother's body and a sperm in my father's body. I'll give you some file cards. And they merged. It's oh, a piece of paper right here. Good enough. They take these home with you. I got jobs in. They, they merged. No, that's all right. I just they merged, and you, here's what happened. The, the formula, this is 70 years ago, the formula of me was bound up in those two tiny cells. And they sort of entwined their golden helixes, or whatever you want to call it. And it had within it the knowledge of how to build me. All the information is there. My mother and the environment furnished the bricks, different sized bricks, different kinds of bricks. And this little teeny weeny thing that was me knew how to take those bricks and start forming them. And eventually I was born. And so before I was conceived, I had no knowledge of self. I had no personality, no knowledge of existence, no existence as a, a person. I think when I'm dead and gone, this unique arrangement no longer exists. I will be dead and gone. I'll have no knowledge of anything. That's what I think. Two questions I wrote sure. down here. You mentioned about the billiard balls on the field. Right. Right. Well, the ones that are haphazardly, right? They just say, okay, there's yeah. a lot of bit billiard ball balls out there. Right. And then if you arrange those balls, billiard balls, to say M equals mass squared, then, yeah. then people start to equate, connect something. Because with of our English language and the knowing the formula, yes. How did the M equals mass squared get there? It Answer the question, though. I'm I mean, trying to answer the question. No, just that question, though, because I'm getting on to something. And you probably know what it is. But no, I don't. How did the how did how did the um, I, I I don't understand your question. I'll try to. How answer did the billiard balls form M equals mass squared? A human being went out there and laid them out. He rearranged them Next. so that now they're in uh, that section of them are in their wonderful, unique, incredibly important arrangement. But they're still just billiard balls. Mm -hmm. How much more of you, if you believe that uh, a human mind, a human being, had to go and form those billiard balls? Mass equals uh, right. E equals mc squared. E equals mass squared or mc yeah. squared or whatever it is. Yeah. How much more your your uh, your body? 
Of course, it's a jillion times more complicated place. No question about that. Well, who formed no argument. There had to be someone forming it. It just didn't come Let me by chance. say, I will accept that there has... If I accept for the moment, for the sake of your, you pre presenting your position, I will accept that there had to be something that formed me. Now I'm going to ask you the, the real question. Who God, God is a billion times more complex than I am. Who formed him? <laughs> Same logic says, look, he's much more complicated. Oh, yeah, I'll throw another question back at you. On the Shoot, piece. I'm ready. <laughs> if, I've if had we, this one before. If we go on this, this question, who formed God, where will we end? Because then you're going to exactly. come back and, well, who formed him? And then who formed that exactly. God? And then the God before I agree, him. exactly. There has to be an absolute, like Henning said. If there is well, no well, absolute... Well, that's one side of the coin. If, there just, the if there is no absolute, you continue on and on and on and on to this thing, and you never end. There has to be one absolute. For us, there's no end, right? Uh, 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 to date, uh, we do not know whether the universe... It looks like this phase of it started with a big bang. There's a great many indications that it's all expanding out, and if they try to run it backwards at 15 or 20 billion years ago, apparently it seems that all the mass in the universe was all in one spot. Where did the, the mass come bang. from? Uh, they say that, that uh, if it collapses back... Uh, if you take a star that's big enough and it finally gets down to a neutron star, which is maybe a hundred tons of weight per cubic centimeter, mm -hmm. uh, which is incredibly heavy, mm -hmm. that eventually the gravitational pull gets so great that it overcomes the resistance of the neutrons to try to keep themselves apart. It collapses into a, uh, past the Schwarz, Schwarz field, whatever they call it, and collapses into nothing. It oh. comes to an infinite point. To nothing, mm -hmm. and then they think that it may actually emerge out in some other universe. They don't so know. So you're fulfilling a scripture. What? Out of nothing, God created the heavens and the earth. Out of nothing. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first scripture. See, this is one thing. The abs the Bible does give absolutes. Very, very first scripture says, "In the beginning, God." And no, we may not understand. Well, who created God? Where did God come from? In the uh, beginning, God. But. Before we get on to that, oh, I have one ahead. more question. Oh, sure. You mentioned, you said, your mother and father, you right. took the building blocks right. of themselves or whatever they had, right? Right. And you were formed. Right. Let's, let's be frank. How can your mother and father build you? My mother and father built me because human beings are born with the instincts of self-preservation, and a male and a female have a desire to have sexual relations. And that's the reason I was born. No, it's not. But you, 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 I'm not talking about your mother and father deciding to get together and, and, and for sexual relations. How could, how could a human being put together building blocks? I'm talking uh, about the blueprint of the well, cells. Well, the, the RNA and the DNA. Would you agree with me that the RNA and the DNA are a formula uh, strung on a spiral helix, and that someday man will be able to tell just exactly what the formula of Jerry Andrews is? Right down, it may be a billion uh, atoms in that strand, but it's a chemical formula, and, and it tells how to, to duplicate cells. But figuring out the formula and creating the formula are two different things. I'm not talking about creating the formula, figuring out. I'm just saying that the formula is there. It's a it's a so mechanical. Where and where did it come from? You tell me where God came from. <laughs> no, me, now, well, I need to get my point across. Look, I have been wondering about whether about the universe, about time, about God, before either of you were born. Of course. I probably have a more insatiable curiosity than any living human being you've ever met in your life. There's nobody All you've that, ever met. I'm... Uh, <laughs> you've, there's nobody you've ever met in your life probably that I'm no one wants, wants more to know the truth than I do. And, uh, just a minute, I'm losing my train of thought. Uh, okay, so let's say you wanted to know the truth too. You had a million questions, you wanted to know the truth. You, what you found was a comforting belief that permitted you to no longer need to ask the questions. You don't need to know. You could just simply answer all of the questions in the whole world by saying God created everything. But that's not. That's a zero answer. That doesn't tell you what disease germs are. That doesn't tell you what what caused polio. That doesn't tell you what caused epilepsy. It tells you nothing. It just gives you a comforting belief that you can believe and say, Hey, hey, he's got everything under control and everything will be fine and dandy. Your turn. 
I wouldn't put everybody in that category because you yourself men know you yourself said uh, today that we are a different Christians than you know than the normal Christians that come. Oh, I, I'm, I'm so not we're not comfortable in our little belief system as you think. Oh, I'm, well, I'm I didn't still know. questioning. Oh, I see. Um, well, I didn't quite realize that. But I have come to the absolute in a sense that I do believe and do know that in Christ, in Jesus, is the answer to every every mystery in the universe. In Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. Bodily. Well, let me ask In you. Christ. That's what I do believe right, and that's okay, what I do know. Fine, Dandy. If every living... But I'm still, to the natural human mind that God created in me, I'm still questioning. Okay. Uh, but the how is and when. Every, right, but I am satisfied, like a child yeah. is satisfied on his mother's knee or okay. father's knee. I'm satisfied. Let's assume that, faith that, is the, that he is the, the first, the last, the Alpha, the Omega, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus. Every, if every living human being on the face of the earth believed that, every one of them faithfully believed that kids, children would still be dying of polio, the Bible does not say for man, look, you have a wonderful brain that I, God, have given you, and I want you to uh, to tr strive to understand the laws of nature. It says time and time and time again, be meek, obey your rulers, and everything will be fine and dandy. It doesn't say try to find out how people get sick. Instead of that, it said it says, in effect, if somebody has an epileptic fit, believe that they have demons in them. And do you realize that in the Bible there is hardly a drought, a pestilence, or a storm, or anything that ever came about that wasn't punishment from Jehovah. Re the Old Testament, did you ever hear of a plague or anything else that wasn't brought about by the sin of the people? Why don't we believe that today? If we have a drought in Kansas, do we think that uh, it's because of Kansas has sinned? What about AIDS? Go ahead, your turn. What about AIDS? That's another good point. Hey, i got to read you this passage. Listen to this, oh, gentlemen. You said go ahead. Now answer that one. What about AIDS? What do you mean, what about AIDS? It's a, it's a it, disease caused a... by a virus, I guess, mm -hmm. that God created. God creates good and evil. It says so right in here. That's right. And so he created the, the, the AIDS virus. And innocent people are dying from it now. Little babies are being born with it now but because God created it. Who's, who's, who, uh, who got together and, and, and made it possible for this AIDS virus, virus to be released? If God hadn't created God. AIDS, it would be impossible for any little innocent child to be born with it. Why should he punish the children for somebody else's sin? Now, listen to this, and then I'll be back to you. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted. In, in a sense, yes. I feel that you're that way. Is when you can't okay. See. It says, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart so that they cannot see. But then he has the gall to say to these people whose heart he's hardened, whose eyes he's blinded, look, have faith in God. What he's he's, he's prohibited them from What does the rest of us say? These things uh, said... Uh, I'm not sure what that guy is. When he saw his glory and spake of him. What about before him? Uh, therefore, they could not believe because that uh, so forth and so forth is said. Ah. See, they couldn't believe because it had been foreordained that God would harden their hearts so they wouldn't believe. So they had no choice. We can agree on that. Read, read a few verses there. What did Jesus do? I think he healed somebody. He tried to heal somebody. Didn't he? Then Jesus said to them, Ye No, no, no. But a little bit before. What happened? Before? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the princes of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up uh, from the earth, will I will draw draw men. whale. All men. All men. Oh, they got something there before they all. All men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. And what was their answer? Uh, the people answered him, We have heard out, out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou? The Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed him not. Right. And the reason they believed him not is he had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. It's right there in black and white. But what came first? There is a nat there is an almost a natural hardening process. It says no, it, it doesn't say that they naturally hardened. It says he, God, hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes. 
answer me one thing. Maybe maybe Please you'll do. add that to your list. That's what we're trying to talk about tonight. Yeah. Pharaoh. Remember when the uh, Moses, Lord sent Moses to Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, I don't recall the exact passage. Well, it's in Exodus. Uh, well, uh, you can add that to your list. And uh, it says there, Pharaoh hardened his heart. I think there's a number of times, I can't recall how many, but it mentions Pharaoh hardened his heart. And all of a sudden, then he would relent. Right, okay. And say, okay, let him go. Here's and he hardened his heart again. Then yeah. another plague yeah. came up on Egypt. Yeah, right. And he yeah. hardened his heart. Yeah, right. Another plague, and he hardened yeah. his heart. Yeah. Finally, there was one place where it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Oh, yes. Well, he's hardened many people's heart, and he'd send him to hell for it. Here's a passage. But you see, one side of the coin, you don't see, realize that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Well, I'm not saying Pharaoh didn't harden his own heart. I'm not saying there aren't millions of people that harden their hearts. But it says in here in the Word of God that he hardened people's hearts so that they could not understand. Yeah. Here's a passage. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come with this I am come to this world that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. That's right. He came to to the people that to claimed people that could see and made them blind so they couldn't see the truth. The, listen to the, you want I'm listening. You, the people that the people that didn't know any better like take for instance myself before 18 years old I couldn't see God in, my, in anything I just believed in maybe God had blinded you so you couldn't just a minute Go ahead. I was blind already like it says right. there the ones that couldn't see he opened their eyes I didn't claim to know anything I didn't claim to believe in anything I didn't claim to hold on to anything and all of a sudden the Lord opened my eyes yeah. and I saw I'm that blind person that God opened his eyes. But there are a lot of people out there who claim to have a light. Who, that, and Jesus was referring right there, especially to the religious leaders who claim to see. We see. We have the light. The Messiah is coming. We are, we are the custodians of uh, the law. God has given right. us the law. We see. Yeah. And Jesus said, you're blind. This is, in essence, what that scripture means. He's saying that, just a minute, he's saying, in effect, Look, the ones that don't claim to see, the ones that don't claim to have the light, the ones that don't claim any religious affiliation, or you might say, or any, any religion, are not following any light, they're the ones that can see. They're blind. They're blind. They can't. They're groping in the dark. And all of a sudden, I come along, and they can see. They say, wow, Jesus is real. You're the Messiah. But the ones, the Pharisees, the religious people, the Sadducees, the Herodians, who the ones see. who claimed they could see, uh, and, claimed they at, could see. and they were prophets, they claimed they were prophets. In right. the old days, the prophets were called seers. Right. You heard of that expression. Yes. Another expression for a prophet is a seer, one who sees, not out of these men, not right. out of these physical eyes. They could see things. Yeah. What happened? He blinded them so they couldn't no, see. No, they, they it were. It says right in here that he made them blind so they couldn't see. But this is what he's getting at. If you, if you just <laughs> let me finish, though, you didn't let Please me finish. Do. They came along, he, I mean, he, excuse me, he came along, and uh, they have a light. They couldn't see. They couldn't see that he was the Messiah. Okay, let's say they it. couldn't see he was the Messiah. Because they claimed to have a light. Because they claimed to have a light, okay. You, you, you see that. You, I'm, sure, the I'm, sure it says, I'm sure you read in the Bible where the, his enemies were the religious people. The one who saw, or the one who says they see, they, they were his enemies. Yes, but all I'm saying is, let's say these people said they see, and, and it, God yes. came along and blinded them so they could not see. No, he, now, it, it, God it says is, right in here, he blinded them so they could not see. God it is, says right in there, it's in the word of God. That's right. That's right. But you also have so to, then they could not see the truth. But you have to also have to take into account man's own mind. Let's, be, let's face it now. You obviously do not think that there is a God actually that is purposely out there. You're blind. You can see. Oh, it's You're according blind. to this, it's You're true, absolutely. absolutely. No, absolutely. if you look at that objectively, or in that in that context, then then it would be ridiculous. Yeah, you. It is ridiculous. You are but by I, my standards. But it, it's not. But it's not meaning that. It's not you're reading into, you, what you, you're reading into something in there. All right, and here's not what you're, there. Here's what you're doing. Jesus said, "I am the door." You okay, are using. Hold it. He said, "I am the door." You are using the Bible for a dictionary. Is he a door? Is Jesus a door? Some people believe he is. An actual literal door. Nobody believed that Jesus this is a door. It, this is what it is. <laughs> uh, he also said, "I'm the light of the world." What does it mean when it says, "Thou shalt not kill"? Thou shalt not commit no murder. Is that well, that's what it means. Thou shalt not commit murder. Is that's capital right. punishment all right? Yes. 
Okay, to God. now here's a Christian, a good, fine Christian, yes. that believes it's all right to kill a human. I happen to believe with you yes. that I believe in capital punishment. I it's not fairly it. administered, but I definitely yes. believe in it. I believe in it too. Yeah, but but here's a here's a good Christian man who can take that passage that says, "Thou shalt not kill," and say that means you can't murder anybody, but it's all right to do capital punishment. Now, what do you think about that? Well, in the original, what does it mean? In the original Hebrew, it's, it's murder. It's, it is it is murder. There's right. Two means okay. Now, is, is is capital punishment murder? I, no, it's not. No, okay. So, so right. here's two Christian people that believe that passage means that it you, you should not murder another human being, but it's all right to kill him in capital punishment if we've had a fair trial, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Correct. There are millions and millions and millions of good, fine Christian people that totally disagree with you what it means thou shalt not kill. We there are even people. some people that think you shouldn't kill an ant. Yeah, and that's why I take so, that argument. If Jesus, if, if you take that, there again, this is the whole semantics here. If you take that scripture literally, absolutely, then you can't kill an ant. You then are, you can't kill a You know, if you took the scriptures you literally, every Christian be walking around with, an, with, with his eyes plucked out. You all. are, what you're doing is you're taking a passage that I quote to you, and you're saying, no, it doesn't mean in it those words what the word of God said. It means when it says, he blinded their eyes so they could not see. It's very plain. You say, oh, no, that doesn't mean. No, no, these people said they could see, they couldn't, and now he... Jerry, one, one question. For True. You. Take what, I know what Hang was going to say there. I'll True. say this one. Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck, pluck it out. out. Right. It is more uh, honorable to go into life with one eye than, be, yeah. than have right. two True. eyes and a whole body to yeah. go to hell. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Right. Right? You understand that yes. where that is? Some people believe it and do it. That's right. I, I, it's very rare. I, very I, rare. I heard about In past, like, it was it? less rare, I would say. Yeah. Or your but arm. I, cut, cut your arm off. But sure. anyway, tell me, do you actually think Jesus literally meant you have to take your eye and pluck it out if it's a, your, your single, your, your physical eye is offending you? It's a hard question to answer when you ask what Jesus meant. Nobody wrote down one word that Jesus said during his lifetime. Here was the Messiah they'd been waiting for for thousands of years, and the, the disciples who totally believed in him didn't even bother to write down one word he said. Nothing was written until 30 years after he was dead. And then they're, they're quoting him exactly. But, Let me but, get in a quote But here. you didn't answer my question, what did Jesus mean? I don't know what he said. I have no way of knowing what he said. I just quoted what he said. If what it says, offended, he says in the Bible. Let's assume that he said. Uh, uh, All right, okay. let's assume let's, that he said that. Okay. For your All right. Let's, let's assume from your perspective, that. no, he didn't mean that. He's just, 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 he's just talking. It's an analogy. What's he mean then? Uh, uh, if well, I don't know exactly what he means, I have no way of knowing what he means. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. What okay. does he mean? Okay. I only threw that. I, I don't. You have to get into the we're context. Not, we're not getting. An, we're not getting into right. that. Right. The only pur purpose of me putting that in there is to fight you, the very way you're fighting. I'm okay. You're fighting with these scriptures about a blind God blinds the eyes. He blinds the that. eyes. It says it right there. It does. But does I'm, it throwing, <laughs> I'm throwing it right back right. at you. It also says that if your eye offends you, to yes. pluck it out. Yes. So yes. I am fighting back the same way you are. Now you answer me that. I mean, in other words, if you are if you are bending, if there's something offending you to get to heaven, I should take my eye and pluck right, it out. Look, you. I you, should take my hand and chop you, it off. You have two choices in the Bible as a Christian. You can accept it verbatim, fundamentally, and say every word is true, not a jot or a tittle shall be changed. Or you can say, I firmly believe it's the word of God, it's it's spoken in generalities, in par parables, and etc. Cetera, and, et cetera. and so therefore, I will take a passage that Jerry Andrews throws at me, and I will use the Bible as a dictionary, and say, oh, it doesn't really mean that he blinded their eyes. What did God, Christ say when he said, You've got to believe in me to get into heaven. Do you think that's literal? Do you think that nobody will ever get into heaven that doesn't literally believe that he was the Messiah? Do you think that all Ma all, Ma all Mohammedans are going to go to hell? Do you think that every other religious person is going to go to hell and be tortured forever? It's not a matter of where people are being t going to be tortured forever. You kind of kind of hit it hard the way you say that. It's uh, <laughs> you know yourself that Christians teach and the Bible teaches that if you for God so loved the world that he gave his only right. begotten son right. and the only begotten son there only has to be one son yeah. right? each religion claims to have their own little son like Muhammad well he may have had Muhammad, more sons afterwards I Buddha. don't know it didn't say the Bible for doesn't say that he never had any other sons for God so loved the world that he gave his only at that time 2,000 years ago his only begotten son, son. That he may have had several since that whosoever believes right. in him should not perish yeah. but have eternal life yeah but it says more than that it says you must believe in him or you won't have eternal life 
Okay, now do you believe that all Mohammedans are, are going to, that no Mohammedan is going to go to heaven or have eternal life? There is no salvation apart from okay. Christ. Okay, from so Jesus. that's it. Yeah. Everybody that doesn't believe in Christ is going to hell. We've agreed. We found something in the Bible we can agree on. Okay, now let me, let me read this passage. Do you agree with it? Do I agree with it? I don't believe there is a God. If there is a God, and there is oh. a heaven, and God is like the Old Testament, Jerry, and if God is listening, he can hear me, because I've said it hundreds of times, Jerry Andrus does not want to go there because some of the blood might drip off his hands and get on me. And I believe that with all my heart. Some of what? I don't, if God is what the Old Testament says he was, I don't want to go to heaven because some of the blood might drip off of God's hands and get on me. The trouble is, you see, you, you don't see the New Testament, the God of the New Testament. I'm trying to read some of the New Testament to you. The God of the New Testament. The Christ of the New Testament. Christ came along and tried to change the image of God from a vain, fickle, vindictive, cruel uh, uh, king to a loving father. And he tried his darndest. Uh, we got to get away from this pretty soon, but we spend all day. Uh, That's right. It's quarter to five. Uh, to hey, we're going to go get the film pretty soon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, five, now, five actually, uh, I'd like to ask you a question here. Oh, yeah, certainly. Absolutely. Let me finish okay, this Okay, you passage. go with that one. You, you fire. Uh, uh, so anyway, they go there to the... And he said, he is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words, and returning from the sepulchre, and returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven disciples. And this is what it says. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Now the Bible says in the word of God that when these people ran and said, Hey, just as he said, he's been risen from the dead, the tomb is empty, they thought that it seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. And now 2,000 years later, you're asking me to believe in Christ when the people who saw him do the miracles couldn't even believe. Your turn, Henning. Uh, you had a point to me. He's got a whole page of points there. Well, you say that you, um, you search for the truth. Absolutely. What, this is the question, what is the purpose for finding and searching and striving for the truth if you become nothing when you die? You asked me that question before, and it's a question that's very difficult to answer. I, I've tried to explain as well as I could. When I got old, I wasn't old enough to think, I realized that man was a wonderful combination of the body of a beast and the mind of a man. And if we didn't, if we just had the mind of a beast, we wouldn't uh, know, we would know what, uh, we would have instincts, but we couldn't have what you and I would call compassion. We couldn't have empathy for other, other things, see. But since... We, since I do have an intelligent mind, and this thing can think, and it can ponder, and has an incredible awareness of itself, and it can wonder about things, and it can, uh, it can try to find the truth by saying, hey, if this is true, uh, then this and this and this would be true. But everybody, people say, this is true, but I look around and I see, uh, I see the Christians who pray when their old father's sick, he goes ahead and dies of cancer. I go down to the hospital, and then the rest homes, the people that are lying there dying are Christians and atheists and agnostics, and the Bible has said that, that, that he will take care of them, and it's obviously he doesn't. Each man's God tends to serve and protect him equally well as six million Jews could testify if they were still alive. I'm sorry I got carried away your turn. Yeah, what I is the purpose? I what? can't, I cannot tell you. Okay. My purpose, my purpose is I'm driven to strive for the truth. I have an intelligent mind. But I wonder about everything. I want to find out, and, and, uh, and I think the greatest thing a man can do is search for the truth. But there's no meaning in it, really. Well, there's meaning to me, but I just, it's not a meaning that I can... It's, it's not a... I, uh, how can I describe okay. it? Why, so do I, why do I live my life the way I do? If, if, if I didn't believe this, I wouldn't. If, if we're just a uh, mere coincidence of chance, atoms coming together, why would atoms come together to find out uh, why are they even there and why they came together? And it's well, uh, if you... It's like... Picture... Picture a, uh, a, an atom of so sodium and an atom of chlorine. Now, they used to teach that they had valence bands. I don't know what they teach anymore. But let's assume that here's an atom, and it's got, uh, in its outer valence ring, it's got uh, three uh, electron shells, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the chlorine atom, in its outer valence ring, it's got three holes, three mm -hmm. vacant spots. Mm -hmm. So are you telling me that if, uh, that if an atom of sodium and an atom of chlorine comes together, and that these three... Th things fit in those three holes and it makes a molecule of salt, that that's an accident? 
Are you telling me it's an accident if the north pole of a magnet attracts the south pole of a magnet? Are you telling me it's an accident that we're that gravity pulls us towards the center of the Earth? Are you telling me it's an accident that that an electron is negative all the time? It's 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 nature. It's the laws of nature. That's the way those things work. When you say that uh, where, wherever there's laws in in uh, in uh, man's society, somebody had to make the laws. So where, in other words, wherever there there is a law, there has to be a lawmaker. Uh, when it comes to m matter, if we don't think real matter exists as far as particles are concerned, but when, when it comes to the universe and matter, uh, it's beyond my comprehension. It's also beyond my comprehension that any being said, hey, I'm going to create a universe, and let's see, what will I make it out of? I'll make it out of quarks, and I've got these different colored quarks. I'll have six different quarks, and then uh, two of this and one of that, I'll make an electron, and so I'm going to hereby decree that all electrons from now on will be negative. Now, that's one alternative. Another alternative is for the God to be watching every molecule, every atom, every subatomic particle in the universe to be sure that an electron is always negative. Now, if God decided to, to cease to exist tomorrow and vaporized himself or left this universe forever, are you telling me that if you go buy 10 pounds of potatoes and put them on a scale, that being no, big, being no God there to control the laws of nature, that, that there's nothing there to tell the potatoes to push down with 10 pounds and they therefore won't weigh 10 pounds on the scales? I got carried away. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, Jerry, uh, before... How do you, how do you turn it yeah. off here? No, no, I don't want to turn this off right, because I got a few... Just All right. a well, I just want to turn... Just turn off for one sec. Getting down, more down to earth, Jerry. All right, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting away from you. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Something that we all agree with, the vortex. Right. We built our own vortex here yesterday right. with uh, Ray Hyman. And uh, you were discussing with Henning and I in the morning at breakfast about a few subjects like Curly and photography. Right. And uh, Baxter, who published the book Secret yeah, Life Cleve of Baxter, Plants. Yeah. What's his name now? Cleve Baxter. Cleve Baxter, The Secret Life of Plants. And there was one more now. Let's see. I'm trying to think. I mean, it was Curly and Plants. Can't remember now. Anyway. You, just uh, for the tape, just uh, right. discuss a little bit of what you have done with curling photography and what it is and how it works. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, curling photography, or curling, I don't know how you pronounce it, curling, is a uh, corona discharge off of a conductive object. There's nothing paranormal about it. It's just, it has nothing to do with a light force. It, uh, if you take a... Um, um, a metal plate and put it on an insulator and look at say a piece of plexiglass or glass or something then you hook a wire to that with the proper high voltage high frequency electricity that you can turn on to this plate now if you put a say a quarter inch sheet of plate glass on top of that metal plate then in a the dark room you lay a piece of film face up on that plate now if you put your fingertip or any other conduct a human being is a conductive object you put your fingertip or any other thing a coin on there, anything like that, and if, you, if, if you're holding on to the coin, pushing down on the coin, anything that's conductive, and then you turn on the electricity and the apparatus I'm using maybe for a half a second, there's the elect there becomes a potential difference between your finger and this plate, which is a quarter of an inch away of 30,000 volts or whatever it is. The, the voltage tries to equalize itself. It tries to get across the barrier. It cannot go through the insulator, so from your finger, this attempt to get together with and, and, and balance out the voltage uh, sends a, um, a corona discharge off of your fingers on the surface of the film. And with some apparatus, you can see a little bit of it. That exposes the film. And there are little spikes go out from the whirls on your finger. Electricity tends to discharge from a point. And depending on how moist your hand is, how big a pad you have touching, what kind of shoes you have on, the humidity in the air, and other things like that depends somewhat on the, the corona discharge you get. Now, if you do it on color film, you get various and sundry colors. The colors were not necessarily there in the corona discharge itself, but due to the nature of the colored film with the three layers. For instance, the uh, bottom layer on the color film, I believe, is red. And when you take a picture in your camera, the only light that can get clear through to that back layer is red light due to the filters. But if you exposed the film from the back side with any color of light, any color of light would get to it and expose it, but on the picture it would come out as if it were a red light. So part of the corona discharge is underneath the film, between the, uh, your, uh, between the film and the insulator, 
and it exposes it from the back, and you get uh, you get flares coming out. Why is there such a Right. force and they can actually pick up your moods why is there varying colors according to the moods and uh, I've seen these photographs myself right. uh, please to explain the leaf for instance the fellow took one leaf and, uh, and and here's the outline of the right. trillion lost leaf okay. here's the outline of the right. regular leaf yeah and then he tore a part of the leaf off and uh, put it on trillion photography and here's the shape a little weak but the shape yeah. is still right. there now uh, explain that please and also why how is it uh, that they have the different effects of different colors and different moods for instance if someone is uh, feeling really happy or really in a in a high uh, state of consciousness or mood it appears more red or whatever it is, the red would be a really deep red and if he's sick or has a cold they claim that it's a different color blue or something now is this uh, pure hogwash is, is it just purely uh, electrical currents? Do, are they reading into this? Please explain that. Well, as well as I can, as far as I'm concerned, they're reading into it, certainly it isn't there. It depends on the conductivity of the object, and, and one you, time... you, you have done that. My, yeah, my, uh, uh, at my age, your hands tend to get drier, I suppose most people do, I don't know, so my hands tend to be fairly dry, and sometimes they, they might be moist. And so if I put my index finger on that film and it's dry, and we take a picture, and if I put my finger on there and it's moist, uh, there would be a difference in conductivity, and uh, we'd get different things. Now, even if we held everything as standard as we can, let's say that, that we do 10 exposures of my finger, wherein there's, uh, we're trying to make everything the same. You know, I don't try to change my mood or anything else. And even if we had an apparatus to bring my finger down so the same amount touches the film each time, and, and we do this, say, with an exposure of a half a second, the results would be different. Now, the pad of our finger would tend to be about the same shape and everything. Tell me the color results. But the color results, in one case, we might have a big red flare going out here and another here and here and here. And uh, so for the people who believe, it is very, very easy for them to go into a trance if they believe in that or go into meditation and then do one And because it is different than the one that they did before. Now, it's possible that, that if somebody got sick, they uh, would have a different galvanic skin resistance so it would uh, be to a tiny extent maybe like a polygraph if they put us on an instrument and ve measuring our galvanic skin resistance it would vary from time to time and uh, let's just say for instance if if something happens and excites me and my heart starts pounding for some reason uh, my blood would be pulsing through my, my veins more and it could change the, the effect uh, I surmise on the, uh, that's the uh, that's, uh, I, uh, no, no. This is mine. I mean, oh. I didn't lay it there for people to read. Oh, I see. No, no, no. No, I was, I was going to see there was that question that you had in the beginning. I wanted oh. to see what it was. <laughs> well, we will discuss a little bit of that later on. Cause I'd like so, to uh, uh, what about the uh, leaf? Uh, okay, not the lost leaf. Like, as well as we know, I haven't done any research on that myself, but as well as we can determine. But you have taken photography. Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't done any leaf. No, no, have you done curly and Oh, yes, curly. We'll do finger. some tomorrow. And you morning. put your fingers. Oh, yes, we'll have your fingers on there. And, and over, over and over again, and yeah. it's different, mm -hmm. different colors. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, a, a color is a little more awkward. We can try to do it with color. But you've I've done some in color. On I'll show you one bit in color here. And also sure. explain, please, about you, what, did, what you were going to do, put, put the wiener on it. Oh, yeah, well, I've been long thought <laughs> of, of taking a weenie and holding it in my hand so that I'm, I'm a conductor hooked to the weenie, putting the weenie on there, do an exposure or two or three so that I get different ones and different red flares and stuff and showing it to people who believe in curly and photography and say, uh, what do you think the condition of this individual was or something? You see? <laughs> and then uh, they'd, they'd come to something. Now, what about the... Now, let's get to the lost leaf as well as... as uh, what, here's what we believe happens or has happened. On the leaf, as I recall, they put it two, between two plates. Now, they'll get nothing on the leaf, basically, if it is bone dry because it won't be conductive. But the reason they get a thing on a leaf, they tear it off of the tree or the, the bush or whatever it's on, mm -hmm. it is conductive, and so they get this corona discharge. And, and then the next day they do the leaf again, and they get less conductivity. They get less glow as it goes along, and they say the light force is leaving. It's getting less conductive. Now, the lost leaf effect. They, they've done a thing with a leaf, and, and after I'll show you this book that has it on the cover. Excuse me, Jerry. Yes. They're, they're, it's losing its conductivity. 
con conductivity. Conductivity. Because it's, because it's drying, drying out. out. It has nothing to do with the force that no, enters. No, the life force. The life force, except if you want to say uh, moisture is always, uh, every living thing that I know of, there's moisture in it. You know, and unless you want to say that moisture is a life force and conductivity is a life force. Uh, the you know, Lots of things won't, I don't even think salt, I don't know whether salt will conduct electricity when it's bone dry, but a salt solution is very conductive. But anyway, to get to the, what we think the lost leaf thing is, mm -hmm. I understand that they, the one guy is supposed to be able to replicate it, but when the cards are down, it, he uh, he hasn't been able to do it. Now they can show, people can show you pictures of the lost leaf effect, but in one sense of the word, this is meaningless. I could show, I could make pictures. Someday I'll do it. And uh, uh, I'll do it, if need be, by trickery. And then I can show it to people that believe. I, I won't lie to them, you see, and say, how do you explain this picture? And then I'll tell them how to explain it. What we think has happened, maybe on one, more than one occasion, is a man has put the leaf between the two plates and, and, and done the, uh, the picture of it. And then he's opened it up and torn off a corner left the rest of the leaf layer, put the two plates back together. There is moisture remaining, conductive moisture, remaining on the plates where the corner of the leaf was. And so when they get the, uh, when they do the exposure, uh, it gives a little corona there around that. And that's what we think has happened. Now, I've never worked with leaves myself. And also, getting quickly here, uh, time goes by. Uh, could you explain, please, the, and did Reiheim and investigate or, or do any explanation on the Baxter's book, The uh, Secret Life of Plants. Uh, what you he did. What you think this electrode business yeah. is. Is this, uh, well, is uh, this a fraud? Is this, is well, this, uh, no, I, I, I don't think the Cleve Baxter's a fraud. Uh, many, many people are frauds. Many, many people are honest believers and they aren't. So honest, I think he really, I, I think he's an honest believer. But Ray Hyman was part of, I believe, a governmental investigation committee. They were sent to San Diego to um, witness some of Cleve Baxter's work. He took a believer and scraped some cells out of his mouth so that he had, um, uh, and put them in a test tube, I think with a saline solution, I'm not sure about that, with two electrodes down in the test tube, hooked up to what is the equivalent of an electromyograph or something that would apparently measure the varying resistance of the liquid. They took the believer in the other room and they had a split video screen with the whatever change there was in the Supposedly, be sure we're getting it on there. Uh, and and they had they had the man who was the believer in the other room, and they would uh, stimulate him some way. I don't know whether they showed him a picture of double spread play boy or, or what maybe poked him with a pin or something. And uh, then they, they, they uh, Cleve Baxter would show, quote unquote, that the white blood cells in the other room would react, uh, stimulated by the prior owner of the white blood cells. And uh, what it was, I don't know. And uh, I believe Ray or some of them, or maybe Ray and others, kept saying, well, what would it be like if you didn't put any any white blood cells in there, and they finally convinced them to try to experiment with no white blood cells. And as I understand, the reaction of the of the solution was even greater. So I think that he's that he's a probably a firm believer, but I, I think there's nothing there. And uh, what about the uh, shrimp? The now water? Brian Shrimp, suppose I don't know whether he first did the experiment, but um, in, I think it's in his book. One of the original things was he was a polygraph expert, and he was doing research, I think, on plants see how long it took the moisture of the fertilizer to get up to the leaf from after it was watered. And he had the thing on there that measured the resistance of the, of the leaf. And he, I think he may have torn the corner off a leaf to see it, how the plant would react. And then he had the idea, as I recall, of burning a leaf. And as I recall, it's this way, the instant that the idea came into his head to burn the plant, the plant reacted with horror and the needle jumped way off at the end of the polygraph or whatever it was. And he, I guess, firmly believes also then that the plant 1,500 miles away or 150 miles away knew when he was coming home or something. And knows your own thoughts. Before yeah, you yeah. It. And, and, and in other words, if what he believes is true, then all plants can read human minds and there's, there's contact between all the plants in the universe. In fact, they're smarter than we are because they can detect people long distances away and know what they're going to do. Tom. Yeah. So what, 
what was the shrimp thing? No, that's not oh, the shrimp. Oh, yeah, okay. So I don't know who Wisdom did. I think Baxter did the, the uh, thing. Uh, they now the, whether these were in another room at the time, I don't know. But they they plunged a live shrimp into boiling water, and the plant reacted with horror, uh, as well as I remember. And I believe it was might have been a grade school or a high school girl did a a um, uh, what would you call it for a science fair thing, whatever they call those things they do experiments or whatnot. And she found out that when she plunged the brine shrimp in the in the boiling water, that it the, the it steamed and the and it changed the conductivity between the electrodes on the plant and and the plant reacted to to that and not the fact that. Mentally, that this shrimp had been so killed. Was it physical phenomena. Physical phenomena. How that it changed? What is it that it changed? Well, it changed the humidity in the air. You know, the steam. You take something that's probably cool and moist and put it in boiling water. It's, there's going to be a, a bunch of steam come off of it and, and change the humidity in the air. And that formed on the plant. And that picked yeah, up now, the look, what I'm the saying, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there. I didn't see those experiments. But right and this is what I believe as far as I know. If Ray were here, he could give you a lot more information. Well, how does it. What, what is the bottom of this, of this belief then? How, how well, does it start? Oh, I think it started with Cleve Baxter and people latched on to it and, and things get printed. Once they're in print, they're, they're, even if there is a retraction written, it doesn't end up with the same uh, display as the original. Like I mentioned to you earlier, uh, you can still read in books where they discovered some scientists, I believe in Canada, that the brain waves of identical twins were synchronized. And it was an experiment done years ago and they had two identical twins in separate rooms, each hooked up to an electroencephalograph. And apparently, on the readout from electroencephalograph, there were some spikes that matched or something. So it indicated that there was some synchronization or connection between the two. Since the experiment was done, everyone involved in it has found out and agreed that it was an artifact creeping in that had nothing to do with the brain waves of the two. Uh, a differential amplifier is supposed to, to uh, ignore common mode signals. And uh, in other words, if the voltage goes up or down, it also goes up and down on, on the other one. So, they, so it ignores all of that. It only detects the differences. Well, apparently there was a split phase motor starting up or some kind of a spike getting on the power line and the equipment wasn't working right and it was sneaking through and getting on the, on the readout. And you mentioned something else, I think, it was a perpetual... Oh, the, the motor. Newman motor. Newman motor yeah. that was supposedly uh, an electric car that was supposedly invented down in Southern California. Well, there was a uh, that that was the electrostatic engine. That was a different thing. Uh, but the Newman motor. What's the Newman motor. Someplace I have the while we're talking, I'll look at it. I don't know where it is. What was it? He 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 ran. He had a great big motor. He ran on a whole bunch of batteries. And uh, he ran on a whole bunch of batteries and contended that it put out more power than it consumed. And uh, oh, something that been open. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, it was tested by the Bureau of Standards. They had somebody test it and they, uh, they were they I have a copy of all of that someplace and they were very, very fair, bent over backwards and everything and every test they made indicated that no, it consumed more power than it than it uh, than it put out. So <coughs> it was as one fellow mentioned to me, <coughs> it wasn't even it wasn't even as efficient as a piece a piece of straight copper wire, because you could hook batteries through a straight copper wire to a motor, and it would be more efficient than than that. And well, I I met a fellow here in Albany, Oregon, several years ago. That uh, told me he had invested ten thousand dollars in a motor that ran without electricity. Lo and behold, it was the Newman motor, and as far as I know, he lost every penny of it. And uh, one, a couple more questions, and then we'll sure. stop this and so far, because we have to go out. Right. But uh, what is your perception of uh, channeling, and what do you think it is? Well, what, what, who's behind it? Uh, is it? Is it their own minds doing this? I think, playing a game? I think this, that there are some channelers who are absolute, by my standards, probably total frauds, making a fortune, off of gullible people. There are also some channelers who really believe that they go into a trance and some entity is speaking through them. What about this one, Lazarus? Uh, thank well, like Lazarus, I don't know. I I'd think like, I'd like to hear that tape a little later. Yeah, we will you, do it more. Just, I'm sorry I raced a little time. I think, like myself, 
was ours, that it's, by my standards, a fraud to this extent. I'm not saying that Jack or whoever is being channeled through doesn't believe it himself, but I think he, if he does believe it himself, I think his mind is doing every bit of it. I don't think there's any entity contacting him, and one reason is this. The syntax of the, I've listened to a couple of hours of it probably, is absolutely perfect. He never, if, if, if somebody writes instructions, if a Japanese writes instructions for an English thing, a tape recorder or something, and you read the instructions, you can almost invariably see that they use different words, right? They don't, uh, the syntax doesn't fit perfectly. This Lazarus, the syntax is perfect. In, in two places, well, there's one place in there where he started to say, uh, wind, w window sale, and he said window sale, a sale, he corrected himself just like you or I would. So the syntax is perfect, yet he has this very exaggerated accent. Now, if I was an in entity from some other star system, and I could enter your body, and have you go into a trance, and I could speak through you with perfect syntax, and I'm using your vocal cords and your mouth cavity, why would I have this horrendous accent? It doesn't make sense to me. Now, as far as I know, all the channels have accents. It's just like prophecy. You hear pro prophetic utterance in King James English. Right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, do you think, uh, that the mind, just like our mind deluded us in here when he did his, when he did a few illusion tricks on us, it wasn't really a box, and yet our mind says it was a box, so we saw it as a box. Right. In the same token, isn't, could, could it be this way with There's these people who do the channeling or something mm -hmm. else that they believe in? There's they believe in it so strongly absolutely. that they There's see it with their own eyes that right. it's there. That's right. There is an entity there. Yeah. Or there absolutely. is a vortex down oh, there. Oh, yeah. The, well, firstly, the people that pay them like our eyes saw a box in there, right? Right, certainly. But was yeah. there? What is it? A box? No, no. no. And and it's and true. Your eyes it. did. Yeah, your eyes did see a box. Or rather, your mind saw the box. Your um, uh, we tend to, in a sense, if we don't think, we look upon our eyes of instruments of decision. We look and we decide what we've seen. But our eyes are like no more instrument of decision than a telescope or a microscope. They serve the purpose of focusing the image of those light rays on our retina, which is indeed a picture of what we're seeing, but the, the decision of what we're seeing is, is determined uh, someplace between the retina and, and our conscious mind. And, and we are told that we're seeing a car, an automobile. We should end this now and yeah. uh, come back. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll stop so this. For 70 years I've been searching for the truth, and now I'm about to receive it. <laughs> okay. Shoot. Well, it's, it's a little bit difficult, but I'll tell you later. You, All you, right. You mentioned the key. It's mathematics. I believe that's uh, mathematics. Uh, in fact, I can call a close friend of mine who's a brilliant mathematics professor. Uh, testing. One, two, three. Yeah, I'm testing this uh, speaker phone again to see how it's working. Uh, yeah. Talking a normal voice to start with. This, this is it, yeah. Okay, that, that looks... Uh, you don't mind if I record this? No, no. Randy no, eating on the telephone? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I am on a speaker phone, and my Christian, two Christian friends of mine from Canada have come down. We set up, went out on a slope and set up a synthetic Oregon vortex and took pictures to show that the phenomena exists here in Albany, Oregon, too, and we've got to do it over again this morning a little better, and his name is John Kalos. I'm on a speakerphone. He is here, too, and uh, his dad uh, is a great believer in your having exposed pop-off, and John wants to talk to you a little bit about it. Very good. Let's go. Okay. John Kalos. Good morning, Randy. Good morning, John. Have you, I'm sure you've been up to Canada. Yeah, I was born there. Is that right? Yeah, I was born in Toronto. Tor Toronto? Yeah, no, you've got to say Toronto if you're from Toronto. Toronto, yeah, yeah. right. Well, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia. Oh, that's as far away as you can get, just about. That's right, yeah. Now, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Ravine. Is he... Oh, yeah. Is yeah, he... how is he, by the way? Have you, have you seen him and spoken to him? 
No, I know. All I know is that he's in Vancouver from the 12th to the 15th. Okay. Very charming gentleman, and I uh, think a very uh, reasonable and sane fellow, too. He does one very, very good show. From what I understand, uh, his show has uh, has come down in scale somewhat in recent years, but uh, Peter is a very, uh, very good friend of mine, and uh, I like him very much. He's a very honest guy. Very good. Now, I'm, I am gleefully happy that you exposed uh, Peter Popoff. Now, this man I've been trying to expose for years and uh, never thought or never dreamed of, uh, of what he had in his ear. Tell me, please, how did you first get to hear of Peter Popoff? And uh, my next question is, uh, uh, what made you suspicious of him? Well, first of all, the TV theaters appear to be doing the same kind of gimmick, which is a sort of a shotgun technique of walking about, uh, telling people they're healed, not of the things like broken limbs, because they simply can't walk away, but arthritic problems, uh, uh, cancerous tumors, things that people can't really tell at the moment whether or not they're cured of, and arthritis is known to respond to suggestion very easily, and of course when they're stood up in front of 2,000 people with lights on them and told they're healed, uh, in many cases, they get a, a rush of adrenaline, and they're able to walk away. You can also see that the tapes that you see on television are very heavily edited, so you can imagine that uh, if even only one out of five of the, the things they try appear to work, those are the only ones they have to include because they do hundreds of them in a week. So I had always been highly suspicious of the, the whole thing. Um, I also don't believe in, uh, in magic, and that appeared to be uh, exactly what they were practicing with magic, uh, bringing down some sort of invocation or some sort of uh, uh, divine uh, healing power that I thought, if it was there, should have been there in the first place and shouldn't have to be asked for by a, a strange-looking man in a, in a $600 suit and a Rolex wristwatch. So um, I saw him on television here, and I got several other tapes sent to me from around the country. What year? Uh, what? I'm sorry, what year was this? Oh, that was a couple of years back, like probably, that was... Uh, 86, I would guess. Yeah. <coughs> Early in 86. Yeah. And then he was also doing radio programs. And um, I had, uh, well before that, I had been on to W.B. Grant. And um, I saw how W.B. Grant was doing what he was doing because it was much cruder than what Popoff was doing. So uh, I went to see his meetings and we got there two hours beforehand. We saw him going around in person even and asking questions of the people. And we planted some of our own people in the audience. Uh, and we told them to give totally false information, names, and the whole thing. And yet that's what was called out to them afterwards, the same information they had just previously given to Grant or to one of his assistants who then relayed it to him. Randy, I want to interrupt a minute. I want to call you back so we put the rest of this call on this end. Oh, all right. Okay, all right. I'm at home. All right, we'll call you right back. Right on. See, it's not fair to put this all on. Here. That's right. For me, to get in there. Very nice. Oh, well, certainly. Uh, Randy, Randy, I wonder if Randy's in my phone book, phone log. I don't know what the time is. Oh, the tape is still running. I better... Yeah, uh, put, push stop. Stop. Right, there we go. Oh, you got any number set up in the thing? So no. I have it in my other phone, but I can't, I, I don't have a thing to hook them both up at once here. Yeah. Randy has videotapes of probably the whole kit and caboodle. Your name begins with a J or a G? It's J, J, E, something or other, Jerry. Am I getting Jerry Andrews? You're very <laughs> close to that? Yeah, what, a a Andrews, you just missed one letter, oh, Mr. Well, Randy. I'm not perfect. No, you're, you're not perfect. I have a friend sent me four tapes, and we inadvertently erased a little piece of one of them of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of him? The, the, the... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one significant thing, I listened to, to a couple of hours of it, and uh, a curious thing, the guy's syntax is perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody writes uh, instructions in Japanese, for instance, for a, a video uh, something or another, you can usually see that, tell it's written by a foreigner. Yeah. Because of the way they put their words. Well, this guy's syntax, in all of the hours of tape I listened to, is absolutely perfect. Now, one time, he made a, a mistake like you or, or me or any, any real good announcer even. He started to say window sill, 
and he said window window cell window sill, you see, just like you or I would. Yes. But his accent is horrific. <laughs> now now if if he could if this being entity from some other star system or someplace in the universe could come and and take over my body and 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 and, and uh, translates his thought into perfect syntax syntactic English why on earth can't he manipulate my vocal cords so that I wh why does he have to have that horrific accent anyway well, that's just one that thought matter, that's why part of earth? Earth? never mind why on earth yeah that's part of the show of course it is part it is part of the show of course. Okay, I, and listen, I am very excited about the thought of, uh, oh, incidentally, are you going to the uh, convention in May, the um, uh, brr, Florida State in Orlando? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know yet because I've got a number of things covered all through uh, May, Jerry, and I'm not sure yeah. whether I'm going to be able to get away for it. I would hope that I, I would be able to. Where hey, is it being held this year? Uh, in Orlando. And I, I told you before, I think, they're having a room for me and having me bring my big optical illusions. Oh, yeah. And then I can do anything right. I want. Yeah, okay. Now, I'm very excited about the next time I visit you because I can take a shower with those shower uh, stop, things properly installed. That is an, that I'm going to reinstall them the other way just to confound you. I, hey, that would have been a funny trick. Okay, <laughs> uh, uh, Randy, I'll put John back on. Okay. Good morning, Randy. Good morning again. Yes. Now, uh, where were we? Uh, uh, you were yeah, talking you were about... me how I first uh, I tumbled to pop off. Well, I was saying that uh, Grant, uh, W.V. Grant, had proved pretty transparent. But with Popoff, when we went to see him, first of all, in Houston, Texas, yeah, this whole thing is outlined in my, my book, by the way. Yes. But when we first went to see him in Houston, Texas, um, the first thing that struck uh, my young assistant and myself, uh, the assistant was Steve Shaw, a young mentalist who works out of Houston. Uh, Steve said to me, he said, it's very obvious, he's gotten so much information. When he would go down into the audience, <coughs> Pardon me. He would not uh, just call out a name, name of a doctor, and uh, an ailment, as Grant usually would. He, Grant would had very little information about each person because he was using a memory system. We found that out by examining some of his crib sheets afterwards, his, uh, his little mnemonic prompters. And um, Grant, therefore, can't retain a great deal of information about each person or not in, in great detail. Mm -hmm. So... Um, when we saw Papa, Papa was calling out entire street addresses, social security numbers, and, uh, and license plate numbers, and all kinds of information that we thought was just too much for our memory system. Yes. And um, so Steve, said, Steve Shaw said to me, he said, I think I better go and take a look in his ear, and I agreed. So he walked down there, and he bumped into Reverend Papa in the middle of the aisle while Papa was carrying on, and looked in his ear and came back, and he said, yep, he's got a hearing aid in there. And that meant that he was receiving a transmission from some place or other. And at the next stop, we merely put a, a very highly sophisticated scanner that a, a an associate of mine in California had. It, uh, it covers the whole um, uh, higher megahertz band. And uh, uh, he, he told me the whole uh, the band with all kinds of garbage from uh, local transmitters and such the night before, and then told it to look for something that hadn't been there the night before when Papa showed up. And it zeroed right in on Papa's frequency, and we heard his wife talking to him from backstage. Fascinating. Now, this was done while uh, the meeting was going on in Houston? Yeah. We, uh, did, uh, uh, we did it. We started scanning at the very beginning of the meeting, and we found out that uh, she was going around in the audience with the transmitter at that point, a portable transmitter in her purse, and she would talk to people and extract all this information from them, and she would then, uh, it would be, then be transmitted back upstage. Uh, up, upstairs, and we found out from other associates uh, when we, the whole thing was revealed, we found out that Popoff would be sitting in the control room looking at the monitors, and one of the cameras would be following his wife around, and uh, he would be making notes, because we again found notes uh, that were um, thrown away after the performance, saying that it's in the third row, and it's the second aisle, and it's the man in the red shirt, uh, his name is Bill, he has so-and-so. And uh, Popov would make these notes, and then, of course, when he went out on the floor, he then had the receiver in his ear, his wife had the transmitter, and she would just merely read his cue sheets back to him. That's why about the uh, last time I've seen Popov uh, uh, in person in, in uh, Vancouver was about uh, four, five years ago now, mm -hmm. and he's at the local Coliseum there. My dad and I went. Now, we're not believers in these men at all, even being Christians. Uh, we're not gullible, and we can see through some of these evangelists. They're, they're just uh, out for their own uh, gain, and uh, they use the Bible for their own ends. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, we are writing about these men and putting in our book, and one of our book is called The Religious Mafia, an mm -hmm. in interesting title for a book. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a lot of these pe men they are just like the mafia, uh, in a sense. They're out for their own ends. So anyway, uh, see, we saw Pop off, and uh, it's interesting that you said about the TV monitors because we were wondering why he had men around the Coliseum there filming and they had their little TV monitors, and uh, apparently they said that this is going to be on TV. Yeah, well, uh, let me interrupt you for a second, John. There's one thing I didn't, um, and Jerry, you'd find this interesting, too. There's one Good. thing I did not mention in the book, um, and it's, I don't know how I slipped up on that. After uh, the whole thing was published, I realized there was a whole episode that I didn't mention in the book, and it was that, um, as you mentioned, John, he would have a guy with a portable camera and a man following him with a light unit, yeah. Uh, going around in the audience, maybe three quarters of an hour before the performance, and um, he would uh, sort of kneel down in the aisle, not pop off, his, his camera would kneel down in the aisle and say, uh, this is what's something we want to use for our TV program uh, later on. Yes. Uh, what brought you here? And they would do a whole interview with the man, no healing or anything, just an interview with the man, saying where he's from and what his problem is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, of course, that is much more better information than just something picked up from a radio transmitter with another camera following the wife around. Um, and we never mentioned that in the in the book. I just, there was just so much to talk about in the right. book. And certainly we were able to damn pop off without going into every single facet of the thing. But that was interesting that these interviews with these people were carried upstairs, of course. And those were people we noted afterwards that he invariably went to and he really filled in with lots of detail. Yes. Now, uh, that, uh, by the way, uh, I have a pen here and paper handy. What is the name of that book, and is it all about Popoff, or is it about Jerry, something else? Does Jerry, Jerry, do you have a copy of my book? No, you, it never arrived. You were supposed to send it to uh, me. Well, Ray no, has I just one, I think. Charlie Reynolds, and he said that his book never arrived either. Yeah. I'm getting increasingly annoyed at the fact that when you send things out book rate, I find that, that but one time in three, Jerry, they just don't arrive. They vanish no, yeah. somewhere along the line. Well, the post office is... Uh, okay, uh, John, how long are you going to be there? Uh, at this address? Well, they're, they're, they're leaving for Canada today, and then they, they're they moving to England on May the 30th. Yes, 20th, I guess. May the 20th. My dad, okay. and I, my dad and I are leaving Canada. We're moving to Britain. Uh, John, give me an address, and I will mail you a copy of the book. All right. I'll give you my address uh, until the 20th. I'm sure it'll get there before that. Oh, yeah. I'll mail it immediately. All right. Uh, it's uh, John Kalos. Last name is K-A-L-O-S. K-A-L-O-S. And the address is 7285 11th Avenue. 11th Avenue. And the city is called Burnaby, uh, B-U-R-N as in Nancy, A-B-Y, mm -hmm. B-C, right. Canada, and the code there is V-3-N as in Nancy, dash, 2-M as in Mary, 9. I didn't get the first two letters before the M. Uh, V-3-N. V-3-N as v in Nancy, 2-M as in Mary, 9. Yeah, that would be V like in Vancouver. Oh, I'm sorry. Not uh, B. V to start with. Okay, yes. V as in Vancouver, uh, 3, N as in Nancy, right? Right. Okay, and it's 7285 11th Avenue, Burnaby, B.C. Right. Okay, I'll get a copy off to you immediately. Great. And uh, you'll find that this information is, is pretty well all contained in there. Great, um, so we don't have to talk too much about it. Are there a few other, other questions I will deal? Sure, 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 go ahead. Um, uh, Sort of philosophical type questions. Um, why do, uh, being a magician, why, even after Popoff was exposed, let's take this. Does he is he still moving? Is he still uh, going up and down the country doing his thing, or or, or is he just completely gone now? Uh, well, has he people lost faith in him, or what? Two two stories to tell you there. Almost immediately after my book came out, I exposed him on the uh, Johnny Carson show. Uh, showing the, the ear gimmick and the whole thing, and I, I broadcast one minute from his, uh, his Sunday broadcast the week before, and then I broadcast the same minute, but this time with the added soundtrack so you could hear what he was hearing in his ear. And it was so damning that uh, Popoff immediately, everything collapsed, that people started to quit at the headquarters, those who really believed. Uh, most of the heavy people, the, his, uh, his controller and that sort of thing, they stayed on because they already knew that the whole thing was a fake, and they were just uh, holding on until they got as much out of it as they could. The whole operation collapsed uh, within a, a couple of months after that, and Popoff went bankrupt officially in court, though we know that he had at least $9 million in cash uh, that he had stashed away because he had, had boasted about this and had shown this whole vault full of money to several of his personal friends uh, 
after imbibing a bit too much champagne. So he said that his total worth was $3,000, and that was just so laughable when he was bringing in a million and a quarter a month at the time that, uh, that we attacked him on the, the Carson show. But anyway, he officially went bankrupt. Yeah. Um, at the same time, well, about a month after that, um, Leroy Jenkins uh, declared bankruptcy. Um, and this is, I think, all as a result of the publication of my book. And I heard that, I guess I haven't shared this with uh, Jerry, but a guy named Daniel Atwood, who is also mentioned in my book, his specialty was doing this sort of an act and then singling out individual people and taking everything from them. He would get the blue-haired uh, little old ladies who have the CDs in the bank and the insurance policies to cash in the whole thing and give him everything, and then he would just leave town. He had been uh, charged with this several times before and had spent some time behind bars. He just got 9 to 18 years in federal prison for exactly the same crime. So the book resulted in a number of these people uh, going out of business and going to jail. Then Popoff, I heard just about a month ago, Popoff uh, found himself back in business. Now he's doing it in a very specialized way now. They have their Code 7 mailing list, which um, is a highly selected mailing list that all of them uh, uh, contribute to and then buy. Uh, they pay up to 5 to $15 a, a name because these are people who all give blindly for religious causes as long as they have the word Christian in them someplace, yeah. or the, the word Christ or Jesus. Uh, they just look for that, that triggers them off, and they immediately send money, uh, regardless of who it is or, or for what particular reason. But um, this mailing list is very, very valuable, and uh, the only problem is there's a big attrition in the mailing list because most of these are elderly people, yeah. and uh, you yeah. have to change it every three or four months because a lot of these people are dying off. Yeah. And also, they're, they're giving everything they've got to some of the preachers, and then they have no more money, and they're no longer any good on the list. So they have to change it constantly. But Popoff still had his 100,000-name um, mailing list uh, mm -hmm. uh, when he went bankrupt, and um, he apparently used this to select certain individuals, and he's been going around the country holding what he calls seminars. And the seminars consist of anywhere from 15 to 30 people that he gathers in a hotel suite, and sits them around and he preaches to them uh, using the same kind of method. His wife uh, goes around and gets information from them first and then gives it to him, but he doesn't use the transmitter and receiver anymore. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he hits them up for large sums of money, ten and $20,000 at a shot, in order to rescue his ministry from the devil. Oh, and he boy. says that this dreadful man, Randy, has attacked him and he's a Satanist and he's a, a child molester and the whole thing. And he carries on like this and uh, attempts to... Uh, to get large sums of money from them, and apparently he's not doing too badly at it either. No. Uh, uh, I talked to Jerry uh, yesterday while I was here, and uh, he mentioned that he saw him in Portland. Was it a couple months ago, Jerry? Oh, it's been longer than that. Yeah. So he's still going around the country. Now, listen, uh, can't he be prosecuted, or can you go after him uh, in what he's uh, slandering you, or, or things like this, or what? No, it's not, um, not worth doing, because you'll never get a conviction of anyone who uses the name Reverend. As long as they put Reverend... Oh, under their see. name, they have to commit something like a yeah. like a, a murder or a multiple murder before anyone's going to pay any attention to them at all. What? Of course, it's my contention that these people are doing this sort of thing all the time, but it uh, it doesn't come through with murder. Yeah, when he was in, uh, I I just like to say, uh, Canada w works a little different than the states. Uh, he doesn't draw a huge crowd. He has his little cult following, and I think that's because through the mailing list. Yeah. And some of these people I know, being in the Christian circles in Vancouver, and knowing quite a few number of them. Uh, I know who gets what letters from where. And yeah. these men, they have to float around from city to city eventually. And once a year, maybe uh, once every two years, these men, I'm talking about these evangelists, they have to hit Vancouver, B.C. to yeah. keep up the mailing list there. Of course, yeah. So, uh, but fortunately, he's not, uh, some of these evangelists you mentioned, I never heard of, like Grant and who's this other fellow? I never heard of these men. But well, so, W.P. Grant is still very big on television here in the United States. So and, yeah, uh, he, he doesn't, doesn't make trips into Canada. He never, no. Not that I know of, but he attracts a great deal of money from Canada. Yes, probably through his mailing list. and that's good, Yeah. So some of these men I never heard of, but uh, Canadians seem to be more awry on these men, so I'm glad they are. But uh, anyway, why, why do these men, even after they're exposed, like take for instance Swaggart, uh, even after Swagger has been exposed, I never believed in him either. You could, I could tell that he was sort of a, a, a comic or a magician in a sense of a showman on, on board stage. In fact, he's a very good one, mm -hmm. Swagger. Why do people still follow him? What is your reasoning? I have some reasons of myself why, but what? Uh, and being in this field and seeing how people follow him even after they're exposed, why? 
they're giving for their validity. Um, you know, they, they ask you to believe that every time that something is said against them or done against them, it's the work of the devil. Um, and the faithful might choose to believe this. Frankly, uh, John, I hope I don't uh, ruffle your feathers at all by saying this, but I must be quite uh, frank with you. The same kind of reasoning that is used to accept these people is the same kind of reasoning that is used to accept what is said in the Bible and is said by the Christian churches. There is no I evidence agree. for it. Randy, uh, I agree. It's a matter of faith. If you Did decide you hear... to believe it, you choose to believe it, you want to believe it. Did you hear Jerry in the background? Randy, I agree, he says. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he go ahead. He, he's my cheering section. Yeah, but right. It, it's, it's essentially the same kind of reasoning, it's the same kind of logic, uh, if any logic, and I, I don't see a great deal of logic to it, I see a great deal of emotionality to it. Um, yes. Why would you disbelieve someone like Swagger just because he's a showman? Is there not uh, a place in the ministry for a certain amount of showmanship? Is there anything wrong with being a showman? Uh, um, uh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Uh, in in uh, being a student of the New Testament and the Old Testament and studying the Scriptures, uh, you'll find scripture after scripture. God hates uh, the, the counterfeit, and He hates people that use uh, uh, the, the, the uh, religion for their own ends. Okay, how do you tell uh, the difference then? Uh, well, some of the prophecy, uh, it, like the Bible mentions, uh, if a prophet, prophet prophesies something, it doesn't come to pass. Then that prophet is not sent of me. That's, that's how. True. That's how you tell one thing. And another thing is, uh, if they are constantly on money and their own ends and uh, not for the ends of the community and for the ends of uh, God and, and they're, they're, what's their motive and the Bible talks a lot about people's motives too and there's a whole chapter I'll just give you the chapter and you can look it up yourself oh, I, you I know it's there I, I second, don't doubt that it's there that doesn't mean because it's there that it's something I can depend upon as being true. No, no, Second uh, Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter deals with these type of evangelists. Yeah. So uh, it's not wasn't new even 2,000 years ago. All right, what's the difference between him and Falwell, Swaggart and Falwell? Who, what's the difference between Swaggart and Falwell? I cannot stand Falwell, too. I think, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I have an, aunt, an aged aunt that lived in uh, Ferndale, Washington, mm -hmm. and uh, she was sent uh, at least three letters a month by Falwells, and uh, one of the most amazing gimmicks they ever did, and of course he was be begging, uh, he would send uh, three pennies on top of the page, and he said, uh, keep one, and send two back with your best offering, and uh, God will bless you and make you rich, sort but of thing. But doesn't it say that in the Bible, that uh, you're supposed to take from what you have and, and, and give to the, uh, uh, to the holy men of the church? Of your own accord, but when men coerce you to do that, that is not right. I, okay, but you're coerced to do it in the Bible. Does it not implore you in the Bible to do just that? To do what? I didn't. Uh, to, to give one tenth uh, of your uh, uh, of your increase to, that the, it, to the church. Okay, okay. This is where I deviate from a lot of Christian people, and this is why I don't belong to any religion or any organization. I do not believe personally. This is my personal opinion. And, of course, I think it's scripture to back me up. I do not believe that a Christian uh, has to give one-tenth of his salary to the church or to anybody. I believe now in, 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 that one-tenth that's mentioned in the Bible, by the way, it's in the Old Testament, yes. and it was to the temple, the Jewish temple. The Jews were to give one-tenth of their salary to the, the upkeep and the building of the temple. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, they only had one temple. That was in Jerusalem. That was the place where they worshipped. Now, in the New Testament, it never says at all for a Christian to give one-tenth. And people r take uh, things and they read into them the things that are not there. That was to the Jews, and it's, I'm sorry, and I don't understand why Christians today take something that was uh, meant for the Jews only and to be the, in the temple to be literal fact today that you have to give one-tenth okay. to the church. I don't, I don't... I don't believe in that. Where are the Ten Commandments? Are they in the New Testament or the Old Testament? The Ten Commandments are in the Old. Then we should ignore them, too, because uh, that's probably rules made up for the Jewish people of those days, and those Ten Commandments are not valid for us. Well, uh, if you, here, and I don't want to get to a religious discussion, but here in the New Testament, Christ uh, himself uh, said what we should keep. He said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. And this hangs the whole law and the commandments. I and if you do that, and of course these men uh, that we're talking about, these evangelists, they don't love God nor their, their neighbor. Well, now let's get back to the Old Randy? Testament, however. The Ten Commandments then are not valid for us today, but they were valid for the Jews of that day. Is that correct? I, the Ten Commandments are always in, in effect. I believe that the Ten Commandments are, are the uh, blueprint in, in a sense of what's coming in the new. But under, not the, the rule about giving one-tenth of your increase. No, in no, no. It's not part of the Ten Commandments. No, no. No, no, that's not part of it, but it is part of the Old Testament. It, we Apparently, we're selecting what suits us from the Old Testament and rejecting the rest. N no, 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 no. Uh, but why Prince, would the Ten Commandments apply only to the Jews of that day, then? If they were in the Old Testament, Christians didn't exist yet. I'll throw a question to you, and maybe that's that way we can uh, maybe uh, solve this. How is it that uh, one of the commandments in the Old Testament was to keep the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. And keep it holy and do no work. Mm -hmm. okay, that's one of the commandments. I think it was the sixth, if I'm right. Jesus comes along in the New Testament, and uh, he does things on the Sabbath, like... Uh, well, that shows that the New and the Old Testament are incompatible. Is that correct? No, it does not. No, it Gentlemen, does not. Can I, I interrupt? I'm trying desperately to get a word in edgewise here. Go ahead, Jerry. Um, uh, I've lost my train of thought now. Uh, <laughs> uh, it had some. It often of, happens this well, way. Oh, it often happens <laughs> this way. Just let me think a minute. Uh, we were talking about accepting what we want to accept and rejecting. Oh, yes. Christ came along. And he said, uh, do not say that I've come to, uh, to bring a new law or anything else. I've come to fulfill the old and not a jot or a tittle shall be changed. Right. That's my comment. Go ahead. All right. And Okay. And commenting on Jerry's comment there, he is the fulfillment of the commandments. Now, instead of looking at the law, he is the law. And most every Christian, when they trust in Christ, like I, I do, trust in Jesus Christ, he is the fulfillment of the law, and okay, the law, and the law is instead of written laws outside, the law is now written in our hearts. For instance, a true Christian will not go ripping people off. Okay, I'm saying that first because we're on this line. A true Christian will not go out and murder. One of the commandments is that thou shalt not kill. Uh, actually, the Hebrew there is murder. Thou shalt not commit murder. I know so many people that get hung up on that. If it's true, then how come you eat meat, or how come you you step on an ant? Uh, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and, and so on. Now, in Christ, in knowing Jesus, actually the, the New Testament explains that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's like looking at a mirror. You look at the mirror, you see your dirty face. And when you look at the mirror of the law, as it were, you see your dirty face. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, 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 not do this, thou shalt not do that. Mm -hmm. And in Christ, knowing Jesus, uh, as a Christian, he is the fulfillment of the law. And the, the Old Testament is like the blueprint, the New Testament is like the house. And when the house is there, you do away with the blueprint. Not in a sense where you, you cast it behind you and say, look, this is worthless, but you put aside the blueprint for the house. And, yes, and but a simple question, John. Uh, just a, a yes or no question. What? Uh, are the words of Christ, therefore, to be taken literally and correctly and obeyed, are they the, the, the be-all, the sum-up of the whole thing? What Christ says is, is the word that is to be followed? Are you talking about oh, I literally like... The words of Christ? Yeah. Okay. Then he says, as Jerry just quoted that not one jot or tittle of whatever uh, went on before in the Old Testament is to be changed. And it says in the Old Testament, give one-tenth of your increase to the temple. Now, did he say not one jot or tittle except for that particular rule or some other set of rules? Now, you, you've gotta, you can't have it both ways. It's either... Okay, that, that, lo that, lo that scripture that Jerry mentioned, that's to do with the, the uh, commandments. And uh, especially because he was talking about it. There again, we tend to take scriptures out of context. And this is one thing you cannot do with the Bible. A lot of people tear the Bible to pieces, as it were. And I, ho I hope you're but not doing that. Not one jot or tittle, not one bit, not one word, not one syllable okay. of what has gone before. And the, new, the Old Testament went before. Okay, if you want me to, if you want me to uh, answer this pr problem of this money thing, I will. As a Christian myself. It's not a case of money thing. No, I, I'm not really concerned with that at all. I'm concerned with the, the logic of whether or not what Christ said is true and must be followed. And if so, we've got a distinct paradox here. He says, 
follow what was said in the New Testament, because that did go before, or the Old Testament, pardon me, and that is established, uh, everyone accepts that uh, in, in Christianity as being the Word of God, the, the two of them, the Old and the New Testament, the Bible is the Word of God, and it is in there. Now, do we ignore it uh, at our peril? Do we then say, all right, Christ, I'll follow you, except that there are certain things I'm going to leave out because I think it's reasonable to leave them up? All right, the Old Testament tells you that tells uh, tells us that we should uh, kill a lamb if if we sin, and and or or if you're poor, we should take a turtle dove or or right. or a pigeon or something like that. Should we do it? Uh, no. Do Why not? Is it Christ today? says to do it. He says to follow what has come because, before. Because seeming paradoxes, as you say, does not make it contradictory. Now, here we are getting into, oh boy. Here's, Gentlemen, here's where, let me quote. Here's where Jerry comes in. Here let me quote Matthew 17, the uh, King James Version of the Bible. Think not, this is Christ talking, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And that's referring to the prophecies of Christ, and that's referring to everything else. But anyway, uh, it's, it's one that is from the outside is very difficult to see. Uh, to, uh, and, uh, uh, well, the point I'm trying to make, John, right. is that you would receive very large arguments from almost every other Christian in the world because every other Christian has is her her own interpretation of what goes on has the sure. can agree that people like Popoff and Grant and the rest of them are crooks. All right, now uh, getting back to Popoff. Uh, is there another evangelist on TV? For instance, like Angley. Uh, yeah. I He's don't. Ex I, I don't. I don't. in my book. Okay. I don't have uh, a TV, so I don't see much of these fa these men. Thank God. But um, Ernest Angley is one person I cannot stand. Uh, uh, what is your opinion of him? Is he a showman, or have you uh, uh, personally now? Is he still going on, or what? I, oh, I'm, he's very popular still. He's still carrying on. Does he do any tricks like uh, Popoff does, or is it just a mind well, game? Well, the tricks he does are mostly physical, making the people fall over, for example, by using a bit of leverage and such. And uh, uh, it really, you really have to read it in my book to find out what his methods are. He doesn't use any abject trickery like transmitters or memory systems or any such thing, but you find out that uh, the people that go to, to his church in, in Akron go every week. It's the same crowd every week, and they go every week to be healed of exactly the same disease. We spoke to one lady who's been healed of arthritis over 30 times, and we asked her how frequently. She says every week, every Friday night, she mm -hmm. gets healed, and uh, she's still got arthritis, and she will go to her grave, I'm sure, with the same crippling arthritis that she has, but she believes each and every Friday night that she's now healed, and we asked her, well, what do you mean by healed? Do you no longer have the disease? She says, that's true. Praise the Lord. I no longer have the disease. God told me I no longer have the disease, and Ernest Ainsley has brought God's healing to me. We said, but you're still walking with the canes. And she said, that's because I haven't got the faith to walk without the canes, and I'm trying to summon up the faith. How ridiculous. <coughs> well, me. on the other hand, millions of people believe it. That's right. Uh, have you been interviewed by uh, Christians before? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I've... many, many times. I've been on many uh, totally 100% Christian stations out of Arizona and Texas and uh, what New Mexico and uh, all over the place, at, and we get along fine up to a certain point. Uh, right, they they agree that these people are all crooks, and uh, they carry on about it, and then they start to tell me, but God's healing does happen, and they start to give me examples, and then I refer them to page so-and-so in my book and say, yes, I discussed that, and it turned out not to be a healing at all. At that point, they sort of lose interest because they have a point beyond which they will not go. What is their their opinion of you? Like how well, does how do, how does it end? So what with uh, well, them and you? Usually it ends up with a sort of an impasse where they say, well, uh, I still believe that healing does take place uh, by divine intervention, and uh, then we get down to a point where they usually argue with me that all healing is divine, in which case I say, well, then all disease is divine as well. I cannot understand a, a god that would bring disease and healing simultaneously and, and be responsible for both of them. Yes. Uh, have you ever investigated other phenomena like lords or... Uh, well, lords is mentioned in my book. I have a whole chapter on lords. You do, eh? Oh, that's very interesting. 
Jerry, is there a comment that you would like to make? I, I'm just run out of questions here. Well, I had a few, just a sec. Uh, I'll let you talk to Jerry if he wants to make any comment. I'll look at my questions here. Okay. I was mentioning to them last night, Randy, and I didn't, this isn't, you know, idea isn't unique with me. I don't know where it came from. You probably do. But isn't it curious that at Lourdes you find a whole pile <coughs> of crutches, but you don't find any wooden legs, wooden arms, or artificial eyes? Uh, I'll point that out in my book, too, yeah. Not a glass eye. Um, I think Bernard Shaw said that. Not a wooden leg or a glass eye in the whole bunch. Now, uh, I was telling uh, John and his friend Henning, Henning is still uh, asleep this morning, I guess, um, that uh, what, uh, let's assume for the moment that, that, that uh, there is a Judeo-Christian God and that Christianity is true. Uh, and let's also assume for the moment that uh, there are, are such things as ESP and whatnot. Mm -hmm. What both of these peoples need desperately, desperately, is one even tiny, tiny, tiny objective proof experiment that can be done. If, 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 if Christians could show us uh, a, a uh, uncontestable documented case of somebody growing a finger, growing a leg, growing another eye, or anything like that, and it, also if the paranormal could show you, you, you are, are skeptical, uh, well, we're equally skeptical, I think, but if, if somebody could show you or me a controlled scientific experiment that indicated ESP, and if we could repeat that, we would, we would really put, pick up our ears, right? Yes, well, of course, John believes that he does have proof of that. I, I know that. It's in the Bible. I know that, but I was telling John yesterday that, that uh, during biblical times, when there were only just a few, say, million people that needed to be saved, God did his miracles with reckless abandon. In the Old Testament, he appeared to them so many times. He gave them advice. They had hundreds of prophets who, right. who, who consulted with God, <laughs> and they did these type of miracles that are that where I suppose they would restore legs. Now, when we have billions of people that need to be saved, and billions of them are going to hell uh, and going to roast forever, including you and me, uh, and so much more, we need uh, that proof. And so, why does God keep silent now? I'll give you, I'll give you John back. Okay. Oh boy, <laughs> Randy, what is your, what is your, what, what do you have to say here on that? Oh no, I. Uh... I, I agree with what, what Jerry's saying there, except that I've heard all the rationalizations. See, Christianity is very uh, carefully designed, in my estimation, that it can't be falsified. Uh, why does God visit disease upon people? Because it's to try their faith. Why does he then heal them if they ask for it? Because it's a response to prayer. If he doesn't heal them, why doesn't he heal them? Because God works in mysterious ways, and we can't question the... Uh, the designs of, of the Creator, etc. Tell me, uh, why do people? Why do you, uh, people have this answer that God puts diseases on people? I mean, uh, what well, makes you? What God makes people? God is omnipotent. God created everything. He created bacteria. He created viruses. He created all of these things. If He created the entire universe, He created them for some reason. It also says specifically in there, "I create good and evil." Mm -hmm. And. You see, that, that I find rather incompatible with reason, but uh, not to Christians, because they merely say, they throw up their hands and say, God works in mysterious ways, when they can't come up with an answer for it. Well, I personally think that uh, God doesn't uh, will or purposely will disease. But uh, why would you ask for healing? If God has visited you with a disease, obviously God wants you to have that disease, or he would not have given it to you. Or, the alternate is that God gave you the disease so that he can sit back and wait for you to ask to be relieved of that disease. Is, is that the kind of is God, God that you, is that God, you face? Is God responsible for people getting AIDS? Is God responsible for people from promiscuity? He created the virus, didn't he? Uh, what about a child that receives a transfusion in a, in a, from a blood bank? Uh, does that child, has that child done some terrible sin by accepting that blood? No, in one case in the Bible there, when, the, when uh, I think there was a man who was blind and uh, the disciples asked Jesus he said is it is it his sin or is it his parents sin that he was born blind and Jesus said it's neither uh, it, it's so that the son of man can work a, a miracle well whose sin was it then why, why he said was it neither visited upon the man just a minute as a test no did you hear my answer did you hear the scripture there he said neither the disciples asked him Lord is it because of uh, uh, his sin, or is it because of his parents' sin? And he okay, so he, the answer is neither. Neither that the Son of Man may work a miracle. Okay, then my further question is then whose fault is it? <laughs> if 
you maybe have to go back to the genes, you maybe have to go back a, a bit. I mean, there's very complex. But Even since scientists God created everything, he created bacteria. He created tuberculosis, that bacteria, the AIDS virus, all of these things. Uh, what was their purpose? Just to lay in wait for somebody? Uh, was it as punishment? Was it as a test? Uh, what is it? I mean, why did God allow six million Jews to go into the gas chamber? I think some of these, I think some of these viruses are, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of the AIDS and how it started. And, and you know, all I know is that it was promiscuity and sexual uh, devi deviance. No, no, And that's these not, things that's are. Necessary. All right, what about tuberculosis? That has nothing to do with sexual, sexual deviance, and it's taken millions of lives. Yes, that's true. Okay. And so has cancer. And, of right. course, cancer can be answered, too, because there's a lot of people that live wrong. And it's there. Yeah, okay. See, well, I, I, well, I, see, it's, it's see Randy, uh, Randy, uh, I, pneumonia or something, what's, what's immoral about catching the pneumonia? What do you do that's immoral that gives you pneumonia? And if you did something immoral, why would you then get pneumonia and then ask God to take it away? God wants you to have it. He wants you to suffer from it. He wants you to die from it, or he wouldn't have given it to you in the first place. See, I don't think that everything that we get is necessarily from God. It's uh, uh, God wants us well, to have these that's things. that's in, in direct opposition to scriptures. He is omnipotent and omniscient. He knows everything. He's all-powerful. He's the creator of everything, heaven and earth, the whole thing. He created all of this, and everything that happens is by his will alone. Do you have children? No. Okay, I was going to ask you, if you had children and they had a disease... I mean, they could argue the same way with you. Or why are you giving me this to, to me, sort of thing? I, I why was the why was I? The virus. I know, but why was I born, sort of thing? They could. I mean, we oh, can. Oh yeah, well, they could say, oh yeah, that would be a silly question. But sometimes we ask silly questions the same way to you know, uh, as a uh, as children to our father, as, as in a sense. I'm speaking in a in a, in a metaphor now. Like uh, God is our heavenly Father, and here we're bombarding him with things that uh, I, I think. Uh, I'm not asking any questions of God. I'm asking questions, frankly, of you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking them of the Christian world who support this, this kind of belief. Uh, God is omnipotent and omniscient. Therefore, anything that happens is done with his will. It is his purpose, his intention. He is everywhere uh, at one time. He knows everything that happens, and he obviously approved of six million people being marched in to be gassed by the Nazis. Or it couldn't have happened. If he had said what it he could can, not happen, it Randy, would not happen. What he, what he can do and what he does do are two different things. And I think that God himself, if he steps in... Ah, then we've got a, an evil God who would allow six million men, women, and children to be gassed to death horribly in the Nazi uh, tank. And I really can't countenance a God like that. Uh, Randy, can I interrupt a minute? Sure. I, I feel kind of sorry for John here. I've been attacking him all day yesterday. But... Uh, I wanted to bring forth the point that, oh, I, no. that I tell uh, the people who come talk to me, Jehovah's Witnesses, anybody. I say, look, regardless of what you or I believe, whether we pray or not, would you agree with me if the world's going to be a better place here and now, it's up to us to do it. And I think in a way that's what you're saying. If, that, that's essentially if, it. If AIDS is going to be conquered and if polio was going to be conquered, we got to do it. So the, I say, in a sense, if there is a God, the only tools he has are the hands of man, and, and, and we've got to make the world a better place if it's going to be one. Which is but a how simple act in itself, Jerry, because if I find out a way, as man did, to wipe out the smallpox virus, what I've done is I've taken one of God's creations and I have eradicated it from the earth, and God, obviously God put it there on the earth and it had some function, and what we've done is effectively well, eradicate the smallpox Randy, uh, virus. Randy, Jerry Andrus doesn't care what God wants or what God uh, doesn't want. Jerry Andrus wants a better world here and now, and if he could eradicate the AIDS virus or, this, or, 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 or conquer cancer or anything, he'd do it regardless of God's will. Indeed, so would I, but then Good. he would be uh, doing a more sensitive reform okay. the will of God. Okay, back to John. But, uh, well, I was going to... change the subject? <laughs> no, just, yes. a, just a couple questions here. Sure. Chief. How many thousands of years is it, is it, is it going to take us to, uh, to have this better world? I have no idea. I'm not a prophet. God no. let little children be shriveled up and die of polio until man, after a couple of thousand years, and he found out something about disease germs and whatnot, then man conquered it. No, like uh, I was just a trying to answer Jerry's question there about the, uh, the, the, that we are to have the better world now. 
this is idealism that will never be. Oh, no, as no, long no, as no, man no, is, no, no, no as long as, as long as man is on this planet and be what he is. But see, I think the problem lies within, uh, within each heart. Uh, Jesus himself said, he says, within the heart of man proceeds wars and fornications and everything. There is something absolutely wrong within each each uh, well, individual's I'm heart. I'm not looking for a perfect world. I'm just trying to, to beat the odds. I'm trying to help people uh, conquer problems that come along, and I'm trying to beat my own problems. Uh, I'm not trying to, I'm not looking forward to a perfect world. A perfect world would be boring, indeed. <laughs> of course, we'll disagree with that. We'll agree to disagree. Now, uh, back to the evangelist here. Did I have another question here? Um, are there another other evangelists that are on TV now, the big ones that need to be exposed? Uh, for instance, uh, Oral Roberts, is he... I don't... Uh, see, we don't uh, get much news about him up there. What's the latest with him, Oral well, Roberts? Well, he's still doing, uh, doing very well for himself. He's discussed at length in my book. Uh, he, um, he's, he's still the, the granddaddy of them all. He's still the leading practitioner, and he's, he's made the most money of any of them. That's what I thought. I thought he was a granddaddy of them all. And uh, let's see, Ernest Angley, of course, we discussed him. Of course, the, all these men are in your book, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I will send you a check for your book, all right? So I'll pay no, for no, no, no. That's it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to contribute uh, to a good cause. Thank you very much. And I also am I'm very thankful for what you've done. You're actually an answer to my prayer. I would, I would put this in, in, in the ending here. Uh, for years, this is... I'm telling you the honest truth here. For years, I've been praying to God to expose these men. I don't have the means or the know-how. All I know is that I had a conviction, and I just feel felt in me some of these men were just con men. I couldn't stand them. It was a disgrace to Christianity, disgrace to uh, what I do up up in Vancouver. Uh, I constantly uh, I deal with I I do not deal I do not deal Randy with the Christian crowd. I deal with people who are not Christians, and I, I reach them. And I constantly had to come up under this uh, cloud of what about these men uh, when an unbeliever I would be talking to them or whatever. So year after year I've been praying for these men to be brought down, and uh, I believe you're an answer to prayer. So. Well, we atheists have our Genghis Khans and our, athe our, our Adolf Hitlers and so uh, how all of these people to deal with, too. So how can uh, I, c I cannot say that you're of the devil? I don't know why. What Christian would say? Uh, I have some of these very questions that you have about God and healing. I have, I have myself, Randy, as a, as a Christian. This is one Christian that still has his mind, and I still think. Uh, even Jerry said yesterday, uh, in our couple days here, he has admitted that we, uh, my friend Henny and I, we are different uh, Christians in a sense because we still have our mind and we still question. Some of these very questions that you're asking me, do you not think, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll put in other Christians now, do you not think that these Christians have the same questions and, and they just don't have the answers? Well, since every Christian is, uh, is his church unto himself, it seems, because they all have different interpretations and acceptances of what they will find in this rather lengthy volume known as the Bible, uh, if and when they decide to, to depend upon the Bible as their, as their authority, uh, I really don't know. That's a, that's an unanswerable question. Well, uh, for personally, for myself, some of these philosophical questions and the wow, how, hows and the why, whys and stuff, I still have, even though I do uh, know in Jesus uh, Jesus Christ, and I do know that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the ultimate, uh, the ultimate is coming upon every man, and that's death. And well, you see, the difference. Uh, one of the fundamental differences is that you know this. Um, I would challenge your evidence that would allow you to know it, but you don't need evidence. You just need your belief. I don't know what is, anything that I say. What is the cha what is the greatest challenge of evidence that that you do give to Christians of, of this that you're mentioning here? There's no evidence that God uh, that uh, Jesus is divine and or that God exists. I mean, there there are two, two simple ones right there. No evidence you're, whatsoever, except by definition and by choice of belief. You're a little different than Jerry. Jerry calls himself an agnostic, and you're an out-and-out -out atheist. Well, I used to call myself an agnostic, but I found that I had to take a stand at one point. After 59, uh, close to 60 years now, of examining every bit of evidence that has come my way, I'm still looking for that one uh, bit of evidence. I've looked through the whole haystack, and it's all hay. I find no needles in it whatsoever. Uh, not one coin, uh, not a scrap of cloth, nothing, just hay. And I've gotten down 
very close to the bottom of the stack. Now, I'm willing to be shown there may be a needle or a, or a coin in there someplace, and uh, should I find it, I will be the first one to run down the street naked screaming Eureka. Are you aware of some of the things in the claims in the Bible, like, let's take the historical evidence, like the uh, Hittites, how the Hittites, uh, you know, they were laughed at. How could there be such a nation as the Hittites? And lo and behold, I think it was in the century, I'm, I may be speaking prematurely here, but oh, I'm in the century, that there's uh, the whole archaeological evidence in the, uh, in the Bible, because it is a, in its way, it's a, it's a book of history. There's no question of that. And also... But does that prove the existence of God or the divinity of Christ? Oh, so you do not deny the existence of Christ? Oh, I think Christ is probably an historical character. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, absolutely. No oh, question of it. Uh, oh, you meant the divinity, that he was divine, he was God right. in, in human form. Yeah, no, I, I have uh, very little doubt that Christ existed. He may be a composite character of several uh, different uh, <coughs> people claiming uh, those powers, because we know there are a lot of magicians around. Uh, there was Simon, there was uh, Apollonius of Tyre that were contemporary with... Uh, with Christ, no question of it. Uh, they were around and they're historical characters. Oh, okay. So there are people that deny even uh, that they exist, and that, I believe, is a bit ridiculous when you go that far. Well, we don't know, but uh, I, I'm not saying that I believe that he existed. I'm saying I'm, I'm not contesting his, uh, his existence as a, as a human being, no. Do you have anything good to say about Christianity? Oh, yeah. It's, it's not a bad um, moral philosophy. I think it's, uh, it's founded upon... Uh, upon suppositions that can't be supported, but um, it's, it's not a bad, uh, in many ways, it's a very good um, uh, system of, uh, of living, I think. Uh, it's got pretty good standards to it. Uh, where, where the superstition, what I believe to be the superstition, takes over is where I really object to it. Uh, is, is what? Is the miracles and the claims? And the yeah, and the, the, and the claims of supernatural uh, intervention and such, uh, that I, I can't quite, I can't, not, not I, quite, I can't accept it at all. But uh, certainly, as uh, you know, as the uh, as a general rules and a general philosophy, I think it was probably a pretty good philosophy. It's been reflected in many other philosophies, mind you, and perhaps even better. But um, as a general philosophy, a general way of living, uh, love your your neighbor as yourself. So that's not too bad. I, I think that's pretty good. Uh, the one thing that uh, my hope lies in with Christianity is the hope beyond the grave. And this is one thing that I'm Oh, well, sure that's something I'm not the least bit concerned about. I'm content to go and, and finish with the thing and say, hey, I hope I did a good job while I was here, and I hope that people are going to reflect uh, fondly on my memory, and that perhaps somebody will pick up a copy of one of my books off a shelf someday and <laughs> get something out of it that will make his or her life uh, uh, easier or uh, more uh, richer or whatever. I'm content to do it once and do it well if I possibly can. I, I'm not satisfied with what I've done so far. I've got a lot more to do. I'm not the least bit worried about dying. Dying is uh, as natural as a rose uh, fading in a jar and just not being around any longer. So I'm not terribly concerned over that. This is where I think Christianity, true Christianity, is far different than any other religion, is that they all, uh, I, I, this is my belief, that all religions run the same way. They may be different titles and different names, but the current underneath, the water underneath, uh, all runs the same way. And uh, this was this was my argument even before I was a Christian. They're all the same. They may have different titles. They may have different names. Uh, little little uh, deviants here and there, but they're all basically running the same way. They're claiming that their way is the only way, and they have the way to bring peace on this earth, sort of thing. Well, I earlier, believe you're saying the same thing too. That, that uh, you don't believe in that particular part of the Old Testament, which says to give one tenth of your <coughs> increase, etc. So you would find. Millions and millions of Christians railing against that and saying, no, you're not a Christian because you don't accept that particular part of the Bible, and I do, and my definition of a Christian is one who accepts that part of the Bible and this part and the other part. Have you met a Christian that, uh, that doesn't uh, believe in giving one-tenth of their salary? Am I the first one? I don't know. I've never really discussed it with many people. Uh, I know why, why did you bring? I know don't do it. Why did we bring? What do you mean don't do it? Don't, uh, they uh, don't tithe. They don't, they don't give one-tenth. Why did we bring this up anyway? Who, oh. who was the first one uh, who brought us? Can I talk a while? Yeah, okay, I'll leave you, Jerry, and then I'll sign off uh, with a final goodbye. Okay, uh, John, uh, you'll get a copy of my book very soon. Uh, after Jerry, I may think of one more question, and, uh, and I'll sign off with a goodbye after Jerry talks to you. Okay. I'm very appreciative, and thank you very much for your uh, time. And I, like I said again, uh, I am very thankful to you. I'll thank you, too, and God, for uh, exposing Popoff and these men, some of these men, because... Uh, I couldn't stand them myself. So. Mm -hmm.
Uh, I've temporarily lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> well, no, but to get back to, he asked you the question, why did you ask uh, about the tithing thing? And you asked about the tithing, as far as I'm concerned, the same reason I do is it. You or I, you and I are saying, okay, uh, let's assume that the Bible is either the Word of God or not. And if they say, yes, it's the Word of God, and then if we permit them to use the Bible as a dictionary, then they can find anything in there and they want. Now, John happens to believe that, that uh, you don't necessarily need to tithe. So he, he, yeah. he, he doesn't believe that, that the New Testament... Tithing one-tenth. Tithing one-tenth, but, okay. Uh, but mo uh, as a Christian, I do believe that uh, we are to give like uh, like you said in the in the beginning there, given it shall be given sure. unto you. Right. That's no the basic. Question. That's the yeah. basic law. But to put a certain commandment that we right. are to give a one tenth or one eighth. Exactly. No. Okay. So so some people think you've got to be immersed to be baptized. Other people think you can be sprinkled to be baptized. Other people think you don't need to be baptized at all. The Catholics, I believe, think that if a child dies before <laughs> it's baptized, it goes to purgatory or something. And uh, uh, if if we could say. Uh, that uh, a certain percentage, if we want, we can say that all these people are sincere. <coughs> Let's assume for the moment that they're all sincere. Uh, each one of them gets a different meaning from the same words in the Bible, which makes it an invalid instructional book. Uh, you know, if, you, if I say, what does it mean, thou shalt not kill, usually they say, uh, well, just what it says. And then I say, you can't step on an ant. Well, no, that means you can't kill a human being. But then I say, well, how about, uh, in, in the case of John, I said, how about capital punishment? He said, well, he believed in it. I said, well, so do I. It's not fairly administrated, but I definitely believe in it. So it, it, what, it, what it really says uh, in there is, thou shalt not murder. And uh, much to my amazement, a Jehovah's Witness is here one day when I was talking to him. I said, well, let's say that if I were married and my wife were pregnant, and uh, a doctor says, Jerry, I hate to say it, but your wife's going to die if she bears that child. We have two choices. We can, we can bring that child in the world alive, and your wife is going to die, or we can kill the child save your wife. There would be no moral, ethical question in my mind. I'd say, kill a child. So would you, I think. And under, ununderstandably, the Jehovah's Witness man agreed with me. Here was a case where it was all right to kill a living human being. Anyway, so, uh, uh, all, and, and oh, I know what, I, I, I got my train of thought back. John said he feels in a way that they're all in a sense, I assume worshiping the same God. This I've heard many times. It uh, uh, that we're that all of these religions are really kind of headed in the same direction. They each have different roots, more or less. Oh no no no! I oh, meant, I'm I meant, sorry. No no, I meant it the other way. I meant that all these religions. Are you there, Randy? Yeah. Oh, I meant all the other religions are. Uh, they're all basically heading the same way in their claims that we are the only way. Oh, I see. In I that mean, sense. No, 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 no. I, I misinterpreted totally what you said, yeah, John. Okay, granted. Okay. All right. Now back to my same point. People have said this to me many times. There are people who think that, that, that the Mohammedans uh, and everybody that's worshiping God, uh, and when they use the word God, they mean the Judeo-Christian God, of course, but they think that everybody that worships it, everybody has a religious belief, is really worshiping the same God, but it's a different route to get there. Well, now, some people are worshiping the Old Testament God, who, by your standards and mine, was an utter barbarian who had uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people slaughtered, men, women, and children, totally innocent. Uh, some people worship him. Some people, uh, John probably looks upon God as a loving father who doesn't want to see people uh, suffer and go to hell, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, other people uh, look upon God as a negress, and, uh, well, anyway, hey, it's been great fun, and uh, uh, say hello to anybody I know there, and don't go away yet, because uh, John wants to talk to you a minute, and uh, keep up the good work, and where are you going next, and what are you going to do? Uh, <coughs> good question. I'm not here on my calendar. I never know. I'm doing a movie part uh, next week uh, in New York uh, for a Penn & Teller movie. Um, I, I, uh, I'll try to forgive you for yeah, associating you. with thank Penn & Teller. <laughs> That's kind of I think John. they should be drawn and quartered for their exposure. <laughs> I do, seriously. Go ahead. Well, we'll discuss that. Right. However, um, I'm doing that, then I'm off to, oh, God, I don't know where I'm going next. I'm all over the map. Uh, uh, I, uh, just, as you know, just got back from Australia and China. And, yeah, I, uh, I, are you going to publish something about the, the acupuncture tests in China? Oh, yeah, and, and the, well, the Qigong tests uh, and the whole thing. Uh, the Qigong tests were the most interesting of all, uh, because they just simply didn't know how to do any double-blind experiments, and we really opened their eyes well, to good. people. 
Yeah. Uh, listen, John has a question for you. Sure. Yeah, that uh, actually was another question, but this one on acupuncture, um, my dad is a great believer. Now, I don't know if a great believer, but he believes there is something to acupuncture. I don't know too much about acupuncture myself. What uh, was this double-blind test, and what is acupuncture exactly, and if it's... Well, are there claims? it's a long thing. It depends Just, upon the belief in Qigong, which is the, um, the existence of 12 meridians in the body with uh, intersection points being called acupuncture points and the, an invisible fluid called qi which is neither gas nor fluid nor ether or anything in it, but it does flow through these visible and, in my estimation, totally imaginary tubes in the body. And it's uh, interfering with the flow or promoting the flow or changing the direction or whatever the nature or magnetizing it or electromagnetizing it uh, that is the, the pursuit of uh, Qigong both to uh, avoid disease and to cure disease just simply by making gestures and or sticking needles into acupuncture points. Um, the Lancet, uh, a couple of years ago, published a thing uh, of, after two years of examining acupuncture, and they found no value whatsoever in the, in the whole art of acupuncture, except for its suggestive effect, because when you sit there with a bunch of needles bristling out of your body, uh, you seem to think that something's going to happen, and maybe you only get positive effects out of the thing, so they won't stick those terrible needles in you again. I don't know. but. Um, they said that it was entirely suggestion that it had no uh, therapeutic value whatsoever, either as an analgesic or an anesthetic and or uh, a redirector of vital body uh, functions. So that, that pretty well closed the door for me. I had always suspected that it was claptrap, and uh, you, this rather definitive test seems to indicate it. You came back from China. You were in China? Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, doing these uh, double line tests? We now? were looking into the Qigong thing, the acupuncture thing, the children who could read with their armpits and several paranormal and uh, parapsychological claims that they were making, and we found out that they were in no better state as far as parapsychology went than uh, we are in this country, which is a <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, a pretty sad state indeed. Have you also uh, just uh, have you also uh, uh, investigated the uh, Filipino healings? Now, what is oh, that? Oh yeah, now? that's what, what. What are they called now? The they're the psychic surgeons. Psychic surgeons. Have you investigated well, that? Well, that's just pure sleight of hand, and you can see them doing the sleight of hand if you know what to look for. All of them. Uh, not all of them, because there are thousands of them. You can only get to the leading practitioners and see that they're performing trickery. We don't know. It's like saying uh, all fairy stories. I haven't investigated all fairy right. stories, but fairies don't seem to be very likely. I wasn't uh, unaware that there were thousands of them. Oh, yeah, they're all over the Philippines, and they're all over Brazil. They're in this country. There's one practicing uh, a few miles away from where I am right now. Uh, his name is Alex Arbido. He's the leading one. He's getting $100 a minute for his services, and... I just got a call last night from a policeman, a local policeman whose girlfriend believes in it, but the local policeman can't do anything about it because his chief of police says it's being done at a church and things that happen in the church are none of their business and they're ignoring it. And uh, have you seen it with your own eyes, Be being a magician oh, yourself, yeah. that it is sleight of hand? Oh, yeah, very easily. What, did it, what, did it, what happens generally? Just, uh, well, it's like trying materialize? to play the violin over the telephone. Right. You've never seen a violin. <laughs> they materialize some tissue or something? Is that, is, is that they, basically? They appear to do that. Right. They yeah. appear to Here. But you know all about the, their claims that there is a vortex. Of oh, yeah, yeah. There are vortexes all over the world, though. There's a, there's a Newark vortex. There are vortexes all over the place. Yeah. Wherever you get a little bit of uh, uh, anomaly in the, the local uh, landscape uh, due to earth shifts or whatever it's due to, uh, you get somebody claiming there's a vortex there. But uh, In Scott Morse's article in the Omni magazine, yeah. he, he uh, was writing to uh, this fellow named Swan, who has a mm -hmm. PhD in Seattle, who... Uh, kind of half believes in the vortex and of course he came down heavy against Morris and uh, Morris's response that it is uh, I don't have the article with me but uh, according to my memory Morris's response was that it is pure fraud fraudulous to yeah. to make a claim of something and he actually mentioned now uh, that he actually mentioned that there are laws against fraud now he didn't go into that but uh, being a magician and being into this and exposing Popoff, why aren't these, I mean, I'm going back to my basic question, maybe you answered it, maybe I forgot, why aren't these people prosecuted? Because you've got to get some local authority to do something about it, and if they won't, what? you can't get them prosecuted. But the law won't just move in, uh, even after it's been exposed in Omni magazine, uh, I mean, it's a fraudulent claim, 
uh, if if the if the if the house of mystery or the organ vortex was advertised as just an anomaly, as you say, and we all know it is to be, why do they still exist? Yeah. If there are laws, are there? Is that true? There are there laws against this uh, fraud? Well, of course there are. But you've got to get some district attorney or some local official who's going to take it importantly enough and take it seriously enough to do something about it. If he won't do anything about it, uh, nothing can be done. You can go so to a civil court and say that, but you've got to prove in civil court that you were damaged by your belief in it and by uh, that they took your money dishonestly and that caused you a certain amount of grief and such. And you're talking about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars and about six years of involvement in court. Has anybody? And if you want to go through that, fine. That civil court, but. Is there uh, Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be terribly concerned about it. So you, you can go to your... Well, I've got the psychic surgeon operating right here. I can demonstrate for them. I can show them videotapes of him operating, and I've got evidence from people who were there and saw the sleight of hand taking place. They all got to me and said, do something about it. I said, you go to your local chief of police. You go to your state attorney, your federal attorneys. I went to all of them. I spent two and a half days here running around from office to office, and they all said, nope, it takes place in a church. I won't touch it. And same thing with Popoff? Have you uh, done? Same thing with Bob Office. Have you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You won't go after him because no, it's... No, the state attorney in California told us that uh, he had to be reelected and he's not going to come out against anybody who has reverend in front of their name. When I pointed out that he wasn't a reverend of any recognized church, that he had appointed himself to be a reverend, uh, he said, well, that's not what people believe. People believe that he's a legitimate reverend. That's all I have to know. So you do want some of these men to be, to be prosecuted, but it's impossible to go after them. Of course. Oh, of see. course. But uh, if the law enforcement officials won't do anything about it, then... So the best that you can do is to expose them in books and to... Expose and, them, that's all. Uh, and you, you don't reach very many people with it. Beg your pardon? You don't reach very many people with your exposure, unfortunately. Why is that? Well, you reach them, but they don't want to believe. Uh, yeah. They say, no, I still believe he's a minister of God because he called out my name. That's all there is to it. And I believe that these things happen. I read it in the Bible that there are appointed ministers of God who have the power to heal. And it's in the Corinthians and whatever, and uh, therefore I believe it. It's in the Bible. I believe it because it's in the Bible, and I don't want to hear any discussion of it. If it's in the Bible, it's a fact, and that's all I need. Well, here's one Christian that uh, does uh, search and look and uh, investigates and is skeptical. Actually, I'm, I'm very skeptical, and when, I, when even a Christian comes by and tells me of the healing that he had, uh, I, I want to know, you know, all in and outs of it, and was it real, and was it just suggestion? What was this? And that's the way I'm like, and I've always been that way. And that's one thing I did pray when I became a Christian. Uh, I became a Christian at 18 years old. And um, I said, Lord, I, I want my mind. I don't want to be blotted out, you know, because I, know, I knew uh, of religious people before, and they're just like fanatics. I don't, want, I don't mind being called a fanatic, but I don't want to be one. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people out there who I do know, and they're very dear people, sincere, I don't think sincerity makes makes you makes a valid val valid thing. There's, you know, Hitler was sincere and Genghis Khan was sincere and everybody else is sincere, but sincerity doesn't mean anything under truth. So, uh, thank you very much for this interview. Uh, it's fascinating talking to you. Uh, my dad's mentioned you a lot. And he says the great Randy exposed Popoff. He's <laughs> unfortunately he didn't come down with me, but I will uh, play this tape to him and he can hear you, and hear okay. hear you and I talk. And I will be praying for you. Of course, you probably heard that before. Chris, is, uh, in that interview, you said the same thing. But uh, uh, I hope someday that you will be, see like I see, that uh, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, I wouldn't hold your breath, John, but uh, huh. on the other hand, who knows? Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you Jerry. So goodbye for now. Bye-bye. And uh, I'll, I will expe expect that book shortly then, eh? Oh, yeah. Good. Now, remember, I leave uh, for out of the country May the 20th. Yeah, so. I'll get it off just as fast as I can. Thank you. Uh, hey, thanks a million also for calling back, Randy. And I look forward to getting together with you sometime this summer when you're going to be home. And uh, I still have that Eastern Airline passport ticket. So Good. sometime later in the summer. Uh, I'm going, incidentally, to a seven convention, six or seven this summer. So I'm going to be kind of busy. Uh -huh. And I desperately need to get some new books written so I can buy a laser printer. Yeah, I have a it, right? uh, yeah, yeah. I have a Macintosh SE now. Did I tell you? Oh no! Oh no! How do you like it? Well, I love it. Twenty megabyte internal drive, mm. and uh, a guy g uh, gave me a copy of Microsoft. Not a copy. He gave me Microsoft Word, but he gave it to me when I thought I thought I was going to get a uh, an IBM. Mm -hmm. And I called Microsoft, and I had opened the package, but not opened any of the, any of the seal stuff. And the gal 
supposedly they're going to send me a copy free, updated for the Macintosh. Oh, very good. And uh, some friends of mine in California, a friend of mine in California started a business. I hope it, if it goes, he's, he's borrowed a tremendous amount of money mm -hmm. and put in it and hasn't got any cash flow back <laughs> yet. But if they continue to go, they have a laser printer and I can just send the stuff down to them on the modem and get the hard copy back for my books. Oh, great. Uh, you had a laser printer, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. you, well, is yours um, Hewlett Packard? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, okay, well, thanks a million for calling back and all the information and enjoyed talking to you. And like it was I a say, pleasure, and I'll get, uh, I'll get your copy of the book off to you immediately, good. of course, too. Uh, and, and, uh, again, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm really very angry about this whole yeah. book rate thing because they seem to. Oh, yeah. Someone along the way is stealing a lot of books, I'll tell you. They must be. Uh, just a minute, Randy. Yeah, John has a question. Sure. Ask, uh, um, like I said on the phone, we, we are writing uh, uh, this book called The Religious Mafia, yeah. exposing some of these evangelists. Uh, is it possible to have a forwarding address and then we'll send you something? Now, I'm sure we can't send you something uh, now or even in, the, even in a few months when we move to Britain because we have to get ourselves established over there. Mm -hmm. But um, Well, your address will be on the book, won't it? Yeah, it's in the back of the book. No matter all what. right, yeah. all right. Then uh, look forward to in the next six months or within the year to be sent something from us. Okay. In return for your uh, sending us your book. Well, oh, thank you, John. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Randy. Okay. And I talked to Ray this morning. I'll say hello. And say hello to Charlie Reynolds when you get a hold of him. Yeah, good. I will. And again, thanks a lot. Stay well. Bye. Bye-bye. Now. now I better unplug this. See, this, this works fine, except that... You want to say any last thing while the tape is on? Oh, uh, not now, no. Yeah, we'll go later.